So let's get started. Uh, we're going to cover uh, yet another exciting topic today, uh, which is emerging memory technologies. We've alluded to it a lot. Uh, and I mean, clearly, we've actually covered a lot of emerging memory technologies, but the subject of this uh, lecture is really about memory technologies that are different from DRAM. Uh, everything else we've discussed earlier was about DRAM, but uh, a lot of the ideas were applicable to non-DRAM systems as well, of course. But uh, today, we're specifically going to talk about non-DRAM uh, systems that are not uh, in widespread, widespread adoption today. That's why it's called emerging. Uh, and we're especially going to focus on phase change memory, for example. Okay, let's jump jump in. Uh, so we're going to uh, I'm going to motivate it with limits of charge memory, and you've seen the slide before. Actually, uh, we've talked about this when we talked about scaling issues related to uh, DRAM, and you know that DRAM and flash, the major memory and SSD technologies that we have today, are both charge based, uh, and you by now you know the difficulties in charge placement and control. So if you look at the DRAM cell over here. It stores charge in the capacitor. If you look at the flash cell, it stores charge in the floating gate uh, over here. And in both cases, uh, they leak, basically. Uh, the capacitor leaks through this RC path uh, through the access transistor. And in, in, the D, uh, in the flash cell, there's transistor leakage also. Uh, well, well, in the in, uh, leakage from the floating gate for various different reasons. Uh, if we had some lectures on flash memory, we would cover more uh, in detail, uh, the issues over here, but uh, probably we won't have time to cover flash memory. But if people are interested, you can, you, you can take a look at some lectures uh, that I uh, delivered in 2018 in a previous incarnation of this course on flash memory and SSDs. In the future, we may actually talk about this in more detail. But uh, the point is both of them are flash-based and uh, both of them are charge-based. And it's difficult to place and control charge as you've seen in DRAM, charge leaks, uh, and other uh, charge is very much subject to noise. As you reduce the size of the uh, storage unit capacitor or the floating gate, uh, you have very few electrons in the end. And as a result, uh, you're very much subject to noise. And we've seen that with Rohammer, for example, uh, as a scaling problem with DRAM. And Flash has a lot of other scaling problems, as I've alluded to and mentioned uh, briefly and pointed you to a proceedings of the IEEE paper we wrote in 2017. Uh, and uh, reliable sensing essentially becomes difficult as charge storage unit size reduces. Uh, and leakage becomes a bigger problem as charge storage unit size reduces. That's why both of these technologies are refreshed very heavily. Uh, I mean, certainly DRAM, you've covered it a lot, but Flash is also refreshed, especially after it ages for some time, meaning that after you wear it out, after you write to it a lot, uh, the retention becomes uh, much, much bigger of an issue. And as a result, you need to refresh it as the flash memory ages over time. So uh, we've talked about some solutions uh, to, this, uh, to some of these problems, of course. We want, uh, by looking at new memory architectures, and you remember this slide also, by, uh, this is one solution direction. Uh, we wanted to overcome memory shortcomings with more memory-centric, data-centric system design. We looked at many new memory architectures, interfaces, functions, we didn't talk as much about better waste management, uh, like compression. How do you actually take advantage of a smaller memory as much as possible? But you can, you can reduce waste as much as possible. We did talk about waste management in terms of reducing the waste of latency, for example. How can we shave the margins uh, without uh, causing reliability issues? So all of these are certainly going to be applicable to what, what we're going to discuss next. So the next solution direction, solution two, is not going to be completely orthogonal to this because you can actually apply everything we discussed to other technologies also. And we discussed that there are many key issues to tackle and we've actually tackled a lot of these issues so far. We talked about reliability, enabling reliability at low cost so that we can get much higher capacity uh, without reliability issues. Today, that's not the case, as you know. We have much higher capacities today, but unfortunately it's come at a cost of very high unreliability, let's say, uh, with the row hammer being an example, right? Variable retention time being another example, potentially. Uh, reduce energy, we've discussed this briefly. We didn't talk a lot about it. We talked a lot about reducing latency. We talked about improving bandwidth in the, in the case of uh, 3D stacking. Uh, we, uh, we talked about reducing waste, especially in terms of latency. We didn't touch as much into capacity and bandwidth, but uh, compressions, for, for, exa for example, a very good 
example of reducing the waste in terms of capacity. There have been works that show that uh, more than 30% of what is stored uh, in a, a regular consumer uh, machine's memory is all zeros, let's say. That's kind of a waste, right, as you can imagine. And bandwidth waste can also similarly be reduced uh, by compression. That could be one example. But bandwidth waste could also be reduced by fetching only what you need, for example. Today, we're fetching, we're essentially overfetching. If, if you need only eight bytes of data, you're fetching 64 bytes in a, a regular system or consumer-based system, let's say, or a general purpose system, uh, because that's your cache block. But uh, maybe you can reduce that waste. And internally in DRAM, we're fetching much larger amounts, right? Eight kilobytes, as we discussed, if your robot offers eight kilobytes, but you may only be needing eight bytes of that. So how do you reduce that waste? Uh, and waste correlates a lot with energy. It also correlates with latency. It also correlates with bandwidth. So it, it's really uh, reducing waste uh, can, it also correlates with capacity, as you can see. Basically it's uh, reducing waste is uh, a, a solution direction that can improve all of the metrics over here. And we also discussed enabling computation close to data or near data or using memory. And these uh, computation inside memory essentially. And this can, uh, this can help all of these other issues that we've discussed. So this is essentially my recap of all, almost all of the lectures that we have discussed so far. So you, you learned a lot actually in this class, hopefully. Uh, and this, this slide kind of summarizes what we've discussed uh, in general. Now uh, we're going to talk about something else, solution two. And uh, as I mentioned, this, this slide also oh, you've seen, these are some of the works that, that we've done in the area. Clearly there are many other works that we've also uh, referenced and discussed, but uh, there, there is more to come, let me put it that way. Now let's discuss solution two, which is emerging memory technologies. You've seen the slide also. Uh, basically, uh, I think there's a lot of potential in this direction also because uh, it's good to always look out for some other technology that can potentially replace a, a, a technology that's coming to the end of its scaling limits. And DRAM, it has not reached its end uh, of scaling limits, but it may reach that soon, basically. We're seeing a lot of signs of uh, issues like row hammer, refresh, etc. And the good thing is there's research going on on emerging memory technologies that are more scalable than DRAM. And they're also non-volatile on top of this, meaning that when, it, when they're powered off, they can, st uh, they can still keep the data that was written to them. And the key difference between these technologies and DRAM and flash is that these are not charge-based. These are resistive memory technologies, meaning they store data in terms of the resistance value of some material. And we will discuss uh, what that material is. Of course, we're not gonna go into a lot of detail, uh, but you will see that. So one example, one very promising example is phase change memory. Uh, and in phase change memory, data is stored by changing the phase of some material. It could be chalcogenide glass, for example. Uh, it could be some other material, but chalcogenide glass is actually very commonly used today. Uh, and data, uh, essentially material exists in two different uh, resistance states and data is read by detecting materials resistance. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail over here. And we discussed that it's expected to scale to much lower nanometers than DRAM was expected to scale. And this is a, a projection that was done by International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductors in 2009. They basically said, uh, this is expected to scale to nine nanometers feature size. It, now, right now it's actually much lower. I think it's about three nanometers or so. So it's expected to scale to uh, node sizes that are much smaller, feature sizes that are much smaller than DRAM, uh, based on projections, of course, it remains to be seen, but projections are a good, uh, are, they're based on data, they're not based on some random <laughs> guesses or dogma, right, uh, as is usually done in some other domains today. Uh, this is, uh, so this is, there's a good reason why these are scalable, because, uh, I mean, I will actually discuss this in one, one slide, but you, you can read the papers. So this is an early paper uh, by IBM Journal of Research and Development. I would recommend people to read. It's a very low level device paper. And these folks uh, prototyped phase change memory as early as 2008, as you can see over here, that's the publication. So which means that they prototyped it earlier. And uh, when they prototyped it, they, it was at 20 nanometers. So DRAM reached the 20 nanometer feature, feature size just a, just a few years ago, actually. Uh, the DRAM in the market that you can buy is a little bit less than 20 nanometers probably today. Uh, you can probably go to 19 uh, around that. Uh, but uh, these folks prototyped it in 2008, which is very promising clearly, right? At least they published the prototype in 2008. And I would really recommend looking into this paper. Uh, 
uh, that talks about uh, scaling of phase change memory. Okay, we're going to go more into the detail of phase change memory. Uh, but one of the big advantages of phase change memory is it's expected to be denser than DRAM because it's more scalable. So you can get much higher capacity per area, unit area. But also, uh, there's another effect that makes it denser than DRAM, which is you can store multiple bits in a given phase change memory cell. And this is because the resistance range is very large. The smallest resistance you can have is much different, uh, much lower than the largest resistance. Uh, it's actually several orders of magnitude difference. As a result, you can chop up the resistance range into multiple different bits, let's say, multiple different levels, let's say. And you can store, for example, two bits per cell if you have four levels. You can store three bits per cell if you have eight levels, clearly. Or you could store four bits per cell if you can chop up the resistance range and re read reliably uh, uh, 16 different levels. Okay, so this is not easy to do in DRAM. It's easier to do in phase change memory. In DRAM, it's not easy to do because the charge levels we have are very small. And it's very difficult to, okay, let's, let me give you the example of one electron. Let's assume that you're storing only one electron in your capacitor. Uh, and uh, you determine uh, a bit zero, uh, you encode bit zero uh, if the electron exists or it doesn't exist, meaning that you, have, you don't have the electron stored. You determine bit one, uh, bit level one, uh, if the electron exists, meaning uh, it's charged, capacitor is charged. How do you chop up, chop this up in a finer granularity than uh, a single bit? If you want to chop it up to two bits per cell, then you need to actually detect whether uh, a quarter of an electron exists, uh, two uh, half of an electron exists, three quarters of an electron exists, and the full electron exists. Right now. Potentially, you could do that if there's a technology, but that technology, as far as we know, doesn't exist uh, today, at least the way we could electronically determine this. So that's the scaling limit of charge-based memory, basically. Whereas resistance, uh, unless your resistance range is really small, which is not the case with these memories, uh, you can chop it up into uh, many uh, bits per cell. Okay. Uh, same thing with flash actually. Flash is a multi level cell today. Uh, in flash memory, you can actually store, uh, let's say, uh, four bits per cell. It's called QLC flash today, quadruple level cell. Uh, it's really 16 levels, but it's, it's, uh, you, can, you can determine four bits based on the 16 levels. But again, uh, because it's charge based, as you reduce the charge storage unit size, you have much fewer electrons. And uh, sensing, reliably sensing the differences between these different levels in a multi-level cell becomes much more difficult. Uh, whereas in phase change memory, it's going to be much different as we will also see. Okay, uh, so this is, uh, I've discussed a lot over here, but we're going to go into a little bit more in, on this. But uh, uh, unfortunately, the grass is not always green on the other side. The other side being these new technologies. These emerging memory technologies have shortcomings as well. In fact, some of them have many shortcomings as we will see. Uh, so they, they basically present a trade-off in the end. The key question is, can we somehow architect them to enable uh, them to replace DRAM potentially? That's very aggressive, of course. Or can, if they cannot replace DRAM completely, can they somehow augment the DRAM? Meaning we can reduce some of the DRAM we have and add a lot of phase change memory, for example, uh, because if it's scalable, it's going to be less costly also over time, or can they somehow surpass DRAM? Uh, and this is a potential thing that's possible also because you can see that they're non-volatile, right? In terms of capacity, they can surpass DRAM potentially, right? And plus, in terms of persistence, they can surpass DRAM. And we will also see that uh, a lot of these technologies have strong analog computation capabilities uh, that is much stronger than DRAM. Uh, uh, you, can, you can use uh, the ideas that we have developed for DRAM, for example, AMBIT, for these technologies as well, but you can do even more uh, as we will see um, in the second half of this lecture, hopefully. So basically there's a huge opportunity uh, that is enabled by these technologies. And today is a really good time to study these technologies. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to keep in mind uh, always the question, why today, right? Uh, why today, it's, the, the answer is very similar to what we have discussed actually uh, for why in-memory computation today. Today, we're very much constrained by the scaling, technology scaling problems of the dominant technologies like DRAM and Flash. Uh, it was not the case 10 years ago. It was not the case, it was definitely not the case 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, 
But te as technology scales, it becomes uh, problematic also. Even though it provides a lot of benefit, it also becomes problematic. So uh, people start looking into new technologies to replace things. Okay, so it's good to keep in mind why today, why not uh, earlier or why not later? Okay, so we're gonna cover some of these works and some other works. And uh, clearly uh, this is a very uh, hot topic in uh, the architecture and other communities. And um, we do a lot of research in my research group on this topic as well. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more detail. By the way, feel free to ask questions uh, as usual. I'll, I'll monitor the other uh, part if there's something that's not uh, easy to understand. I'm not gonna, so I'm going to uh, uh, draw the line at an abstraction level. We could go into a lot of device level uh, analyses of these uh, emerging technologies. That's not my purpose. If you actually take a device level course, uh, perhaps you can go into how the phase change memory exactly works. You can look at the IV curves. You can look at different curves uh, that you have. We're not going to do any of that. We're going to uh, cover the basic uh, properties of the device as uh, it would be useful for an architect. Uh, if you study the reliability of the device, you may need to go much lower uh, to, to, to much lower abstraction levels, but uh, our purpose is not that at this point. Okay. So let's talk about charge versus resistive, even though we've also already discussed this, uh, maybe hammered at home. Essentially, charge-based memory uh, is vulnerable to noise. You write data by capturing some charge in a storage device, and you read data by detecting some voltage. Resistive memory, there are multiple examples of this, phase change memory, memristors, RAM, resistive RAM, sometimes called, unfortunately, uh, it's, it overlaps with resistive memory. Uh, STTM RAM, these all operate in using some different principles, but in the end, uh, you, you, uh, you store data in forms of resist resistance, basically. You write data by pulsing some current over time, and you read data by detecting resistance. And there are multiple different reading methods, uh, so don't get hung up on exactly how you read it. It's not that important also. The key takeaway is really you storing data in terms of the resistance value of a particular uh, material. Okay, and these things uh, differ from each other uh, these different technologies differ from each other. We're going to cover a lot of uh, phase change memory, a little bit STTM RAM, not a whole lot on memristors, just because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, material, at least public material, on phase change memory and uh, STTM RAM. That's, that's the reason why we're going to focus more on these technologies. Uh, but this technology is also pr similarly promising, so keep that in mind. Uh, so phase change memory, uh, you inject current to change the material phase. Uh, and resistance is determined by the phase of the material. And we will go into a little more into this. In STTM RAM, the operation principle is different. You inject current to change the polarity of a magnet and resistance is determined by the polarity or which direction uh, the uh, magnetic field is essentially compared to a reference. And in memristors, RAM, RAM, uh, these differ actually exactly in how they operate, but one common operational principle is that you inject current to change the atomic structure of the device and resistance is determined by the atom distance. Okay, so you don't need to understand uh, more beyond this uh, to really know how, uh, you don't need to know exactly how these underlying technologies operate clearly. Let's go into phase change memory a little bit because as I mentioned, this is uh, probably the most promising. It was the most promising at the time we started studying it. And uh, as, I, as I also said, Intel's 3D X point is very, very likely phase change memory, uh, even though I still uh, have not seen uh, evidence uh, from Intel admitting that. Uh, they call it 3D X point because it's a, it has a 3D cross point uh, structure, uh, similar to the crossbars we're going to examine later on when we talk about in-memory computation using some of these devices. Uh, but uh, 3D X point doesn't give you anything in terms of what is the material underneath or what is the operational principle underneath? Uh, okay, uh, so phase change memory is actually uh, a really old type of memory. It was developed in 1960s. And if you use CD, rewritable CDs, you, uh, well, uh, I don't think many people use rewritable CDs these days, but I think I asked a question at some point and somebody said they use it. Uh, I don't use them anymore. But these rewritable CDs, uh, compact disks, uh, they actually use phase change memory as their storage cells inside them. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, why in a little bit. But basically, phase change material, 
let's say chalcogenite glass exists in two different states, amorphous and crystalline. And these two different states can be distinguished from each other uh, based on the electrical resistivity they have. One amorphous has very high electrical resistivity, crystalline has very low electrical resistivity. At the same time, amorphous has very low optical reflexivity and crystalline has very high optical reflectivity. So the uh, uh, rewritable CDs actually operate based on this optical reflexivity principle. They shine light on uh, basically the reading device, shines light on the cell. And depending on the reflections that you get, uh, you decide uh, whether the cell is an amorphous versus crystalline state. And that distinguishes between a one and zero clearly in the rewritable CD. So a rewritable CD uses uh, the same principle, except its reading process is not based on the detecting the resistance. Its reading process is much slower, uh, higher high bandwidth perhaps, but slower. Uh, and uh, it's not, as a result, it's not suitable for uh, a replacement for DRAM because this is a very slow process as you can see. Uh, so uh, the reason why phase change memory became very interesting recently is some companies like IBM and Intel, uh, they actually uh, put a lot of effort into uh, creating uh, a, a read device or read unit, let's say, which is access device over here. If you see a read unit that can detect, reliably detect the resistance levels in a much faster way. Because you need that speed if you want to try to replace DRAM or if you want to try to replace SSDs even, right? SSDs are much faster than uh, rewritable CDs today. So basically, and these folks succeeded, both IBM and Intel. And as a result, uh, uh, phase change memory became much closer to reality after these access devices uh, were developed, reliable access devices were developed. So you can think of these access devices as the sense amplifiers in DRAM, right? That's essentially what it is. Basically, you can see the storage unit over here. So this is an example of a phase change memory cell. You can see the storage unit, which is chalcogenite glass inside. Uh, and you store data in terms of resistance as this depicts. And you can see the bit line over here and you can see the word line over here. And you can see it's an access device. This is the access transistor plus the sense amplifier, let's say, but it's really, well, I said sense amplifier earlier, but it's, uh, I, I will correct myself. It's really the access transistor type of device over here. And that enables you to actually uh, sense the data much more reliably and fast uh, based on what's actually put over here. But sense amplifier also plays a part. So it's really the uh, access device plus uh, the sense amplifier that makes it work in the end. And that makes it different from a rewritable CD. Okay, so that's, uh, if you're interested in more of this, you should take a look at the IBM Journal of Research and Development paper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in 2008. Okay, this is another depiction of uh, how, how this is uh, put. You have the metals over here, access metal over here, and the bit line over here, and the chalcogenide glasses here, and then you have the heating structure. So to be able to transition between states, you need to heat, uh, as we will see in the next slide, you need to heat this material. As, uh, so that's, 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 going, that's going to be one of the difficulties in constructing the memory because DGM doesn't require heating, for example, right? That's one of the fundamental shortcomings of this memory also compared to DRAM because heating by nature is a little bit intrusive in terms of uh, reliability, in terms of power, in terms of bandwidth, because if you want to heat many of these, many of these cells at the same time, uh, you're very much bound by uh, your thermals as well as, as well as power limits. Uh, okay, but uh, it's good to consider these when you're thinking about new memories. But people actually put a lot of effort into making this happen, let's say, and they made it happen, as you can see from 3D exploit memory. But it's not as good as DM, as you can also see from 3D exploit memory. So PCM is resistive memory. So high resistance state can be encoded with a zero and low resistance state can be encoded with uh, one, as you can see. Okay, I see Gagan posted the uh, IBM Journal of Research and Development paper. That's good. Thanks. Uh, uh, so you can encode either state with a zero or one, as we know. And the key thing is PCM cell can be switched uh, between states reliably and quickly. Okay, now let's take a look at how you switch between states. Uh, so how does this work? You basically, uh, to, be, to be able to write data, you change the phase of the material by injecting current. So what does writing data mean? Uh, you need to write data uh, as one uh, or zero uh, to be able to uh, let's say set 
uh, the memory uh, to one. I mean, encoding is different from setting and reset. You can you can encode a reset uh, state as one as zero as one and set state as zero also. But basically, uh, you need to encode in different ways. Clearly, uh, to set the cell, you basically need to inject sustained current over time for some longer amount of time to heat the cell above some crystallization temperature, uh, and and then cool it down as you can see over here. So that's the idea over here. And this temperature is not as high as reset temperature, as you can see over here. Uh, and to reset the cell, let's say erase it to zero, you need to heat the cell with, to a very high temperature and uh, about T melting, let's say, and then quench it very quickly. That's the idea. That's how we can store a one or zero or zero or one, depending on how we encode a reset state and set state. To read data, you need to detect the phase via materials resistance. And there are multiple ways of doing it. Basically, you need to distinguish between the amorphous and crystalline states. So there is one question. Let me take a look. Is the way we address memory is the same uh, in both PCM and DM? And the answer is, I think, yes, over here. Basically, all of the peripheral structures can remain the same. And uh, you will see the, it, it in the papers that we're going to reference. OK. So that's how you uh, write data and read data. And these were manufactured. This is actually uh, from IBM. Uh, IBM actually was one of the first companies to manufacture this. And you can see this is the set state, crystalline state. It has very low resistance, which means that you can have very large current. So you can actually detect the resistance by measuring the current, as you can see. Because if you have low resistance, you, which you mean, it means that you have large current that can flow uh, because of the characteristics of Kirchhoff's laws, right? Uh, and then uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you're in amorphous state, you have high, very high resistance. As a result, you have small current flowing through the memory element. So you can detect that small current. So basically, you can, you can detect the differences by measuring these current pulses that happen uh, in the memory element. And that happens to, and, and these read devices uh, happen to uh, be reliable in detecting that. And those are the key uh, reasons why this memory has become relatively fast today compared to the past. So these read, read devices are very important. People put a lot of effort into figuring out how to measure this current. Uh, Okay, and you can see the difference between the resistance range. I said orders of magnitude, and it's, oh, it is orders of magnitude, three to four orders of magnitude difference in terms of uh, the two different states. So there is enough room for uh, measuring different levels of current also so that you can store multiple bits per cell. Okay. Okay, so I gave you, I think, all of the device level uh, knowledge that you need to have. Now we're going to build, uh, build uh, a higher level architectural uh, understanding of this. So let's, uh, let's talk about the advantages of this. So uh, a big advantage is uh, this scales better than DM and flash. Basically, it requires current pulses to read, uh, which scale linearly with the feature size. And if you want to learn more about this, read the, uh, this paper from IBM and also our paper that I'm going to reference later on. And we also discussed that as a result, it can scale to much lower nanometers. Actually, there are many other prototypes right now that are lower than 20 nanometers. Uh, I don't know what is 3DX point, what nanometers is it, it is, but uh, it's quite dense, as you know. Uh, it can be denser than DM. You can store multiple bits per cell uh, due to a large resistance range, as we discussed. And even as early as 2008, uh, there were two bits per cell and four bits per cell happened actually in 2012 earlier. And later, people have looked at even uh, uh, eight bits per cell. It's non-volatile. Basically, it can retain data for much longer than 10 years at high uh, temperatures, which is good without powering it off. And there's no refresh needed. So it gets rid of one of the big scaling limits of DM, as you can see. Uh, and you get low idle power as a result of this also. And also, you don't have the uh, static leakage that DM has. There's a, some other sort of leakage, but it's not really the DM type of leakage. OK. OK, so clearly these are advantages, as you can see. So let's take a look at the multi-level cell. Uh, this is a pictorial view of uh, cell resistance. It can go from, I don't know, some value to some value. It's not important. But basically, you have a reference voltage. Uh, and you basically figure out whether the voltage uh, that you have is really uh, below the reference voltage or above the reference voltage. And you can encode the values that are below the reference voltage as one and values that are above the reference voltage as zero. And I say voltage and resistance, you could actually have different methods of doing this. 
usually people measure uh, with voltage differences because voltage may be easier to measure than just direct resistance measurements. Uh, but clearly, if we can re measure resistance or, or even current, uh, you, can, you can get this. But basically, you could you chop up the resistance range into two different regions and figure out uh, uh, which resistance re level you're at to determine the value that's stored. OK, multi-level cell PCM. Uh, basically, you store more than one pit per cell. This can further increase density significantly. But this also has drawbacks, as we will see, because it leads to higher latency and energy than single-level cell phase change memory. This is true for flash memory also, by the way. Flash memory, uh, as you go to multi-level cell flash memory, it becomes higher latency and higher energy. And we will see the reason for it later on. Uh, but well, I guess I'm going to tell you the reason, but I'm going to tell you the exact numbers uh, later on. But basically, the idea is this. You have a resistance range, same resistance range as what we had over here, exactly the same range. Instead of chopping it up into two levels, you chop it up into four levels. Okay, And you encode the different levels uh, as different two-bit values. Makes sense, right? Because you have four levels, you, ca you can have four two bits per cell in this case. Uh, and how do you read this? Well, to be able to read this, now you have an issue. Uh, what you can do uh, in flash, for example, in flash it's voltage levels actually, uh, but here it can also potentially be voltage levels. Uh, uh, you can actually determine the resistance based on the voltage potentially, right? Uh, but basically, you you basically have a reference resistance, let's say in this case, uh, just to keep your memory jogged. Uh, uh, you can basically first read the cell and try to check if it's if the cell is uh, below this resistance uh, reference resistance or above this reference resistance. If it's below, you know that bit one is one. Right? If it's above, you know that bit zero is uh, bit one is zero. But you don't know the value of bit zero, right? So depending on whether this uh, cell resistance is below or above, you use a second reference resistance or reference voltage to uh, di distinguish uh, what the bit zero is. So I assume that the first reference resistance told you that the cell value is somewhere here then you use another reference resistance over here to decide whether the bit zero is one or zero. Right? That's the idea basically. So it takes longer to read two bits than one bit because you need to do two different checks. I'm gonna show you another, another reading method uh, in a little bit. Well, maybe not so little bit, but uh, later during this lecture. Okay, but regardless of the reading level, it takes longer to determine uh, uh, things that are chopped up into more levels uh, compared to things that are chopped up into less levels. So in DRAM, let's go back to DRAM. In DRAM, clearly you distinguish between one and zero uh, as cell that's charged or discharged, right? So you don't look at resistance, but you don't you look at charge uh, level over here. And uh, clearly there's some um, sense amplifier has some margin, noise margin also. So there are some DRAM cells that are closer to uh, the noise margin that are farther away from the uh, noise margin as well. So we've seen that variation uh, in terms of uh, how, uh, how strong the cell is and how weak the cell is when we talk about latency, for example. But in DRAM, it's very difficult to do what, just, what I just discussed over here, because the uh, charge, cell charge values, uh, cell charge range is very small. As a result, chopping it up into very small ranges uh, makes it very difficult to detect which range you're in. Even, 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 even this is becoming difficult as we discussed, right? Because the charge, uh, amount of charge you're storing uh, is uh, reducing with technology generation. And keep in mind uh, my analogy between one electron and zero electron. You can maybe distinguish between the existence of an electron and the lack of existence of an electron. But how do you do that? Uh, how do you chop a single electron into four different levels? Okay, I think there's some question over here. Let me take a look. Does it take longer than reading two single bit uh, cells? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't think it does take longer than reading two single bit cells, uh, unless, uh, well, if you're doing the two, if you're reading two single bit cells serially, right? If you're reading two single bit cells serially, then uh, that takes very long, of course. If you're doing it in parallel uh, in different sub arrays, for example, then that could take much shorter than what I just discussed over here. So it really depends. The answer really depends on how you're reading two single bit cells, okay? But uh, with two single bit cells, clearly you're not getting the capacity benefits. Uh, here, the goal is to get the capacity doubled uh, without doing much 
but uh, we can also see the capacity latency trade-off over here, right? We saw the capacity latency trade-off earlier uh, in terms of the size of a subarray. If you reduce the size of the subarray, your capacity reduces by your latency increases. If you increase the size of the subarray, your capacity increases, but your latency uh, also increases. Here, uh, we're increasing our capacity uh, by storing two bits per cell, uh, but we're not, uh, we're also increasing latency by storing two bits per cell. So that, uh, as I mentioned, when we discussed the capacity latency trade-off, that trade-off is extremely fundamental, right? Regardless of however you increase your capacity, you're going to have some sort of latency impact. Okay. Okay, basically, uh, once you have uh, resistance chopped up into four levels, now you have less margin between values also. So you may actually run into reliability issues. You need more precise sensing and modification of the cell contents. Because earlier, if you go back over here again, you can, uh, you can program the cell to some resistance value that's here and it may be okay. So you can program to, to, to encode a one, you can program the cell to some resistance value that's anywhere around here, right? Okay, with some margin, of course. You don't wanna get too close to this resistance value because that's where the errors happen because your reading is not perfect also. But as you chop it up into finer granularity, your margin reduces clearly. And now you need to be very precise in terms of how you write. So write latency is also increased actually because you're now you're writing two bits per cell and you're, you need to program the cell in a fine grain uh, level. So you, you, can, you, you can see that you get higher latency and energy uh, in a uh, multi-level cell. Okay, we're gonna see that uh, later on again. Okay, keep that in mind. This is also very fundamental to flash memory as well. Uh, you can read the papers that I mentioned about flash memory uh, in the past. They all talk about this. So in a sense, there is nothing new here in phase change memory compared to flash memory, except we're talking about resistance here. Okay, the, the margin is much larger basically. So let's talk about uh, phase change memory properties, architectural properties a little bit more and see how we can make use of this uh, technology architecturally in a real system potentially. So I'm going to talk about a work that we started in 2007 when I was at Microsoft Research and we published in ISCA 2009. This was one of the three papers that talked about phase change memory as an emerging technology in the same session in ISCA. So multiple people had the same uh, nice idea, let's say, uh, like us uh, to understand if we can actually replace DRAM with phase change memory. So to be able to do this study, it's not easy actually, because we, don't, we didn't have access to phase change memory chips, even though some of those chips existed at that time, we didn't have access to them. And existed doesn't mean that the chip is uh, four gigabytes, for example. Actually, the prototypes at that time were very small. So I think the largest one may be one megabyte. Clearly, you cannot do much studies with a one megabyte uh, phase change memory chip, right? You cannot replace DRAM because there are very few applications that can run on a one megabyte main memory today. In the past, that may have been true, but today that's not true, which also indicates how much power we need from our computers today, right? In terms of storage capacity, we cannot go back uh, 20 years and say, or 30 years and say, all right, let's, let's make our memory smaller, right? Uh, okay, so we cannot do the study on a real system clearly. So we actually, uh, and, and uh, understanding how an emerging memory technology will impact your performance if you replace DRAM uh, with that emerging memory technology requires you to do simulation at the end. Analytical modeling could be another possibility, but it's not that easy. Uh, as we discussed in the last lecture, we resorted to simulation uh, over here. And clearly you cannot prototype it. This memory doesn't exist uh, for all practical purposes. Uh, so what we did was we surveyed prototypes uh, that were published in lower level device conferences and circuits conferences, as you can see, uh, IEDM is the International Electron Devices Meeting, which is uh, the top device, one of the top device conferences. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a picture later on. We surveyed a bunch of prototypes and we wanted to understand the different properties we should use in our simulation. Basically, how do we model uh, this device that doesn't exist yet? So clearly we want to model a read latency. We want to model a write latency. We want to model, uh, I don't know, TRC, different timing parameters uh, in this technology. And we wanted to derive those. And clearly it's not possible to have a real device. So how do you derive that? So this is actually not an easy task. And an architect, as I mentioned in the past is a dreamer, a creator. And this is one of the big functions of an architect in my opinion, understanding how uh, future technology will evolve and understanding how architecture should evolve to adapt to that future technology before that future technology actually exists, even exists. 
And uh, that's what we did with simulation, you can do that. And this is, uh, but it's not easy. And this, uh, this chart over here, that's from our uh, next paper, which is uh, this 2010 paper, shows why it's not easy. Well, uh, why it's not easy, because there are a bunch of parameters that you may be interested in as an architect, like cell size, uh, like the access device, maybe, may not, may not be, be interested. But read time, you're definitely interested. Read current, read voltage, read power, read energy. All of these are interests. Set time, reset time, right endurance, meaning uh, how many times you can write to the cell before the cell dies. So endurance is a problem in phase change memory, as we will discuss. So you, you're, you're definitely very interested in those parameters as an architect who wants to simulate whether this technology is viable in terms of performance and energy and endurance reliability. Uh, the problem is all of these publications, because it's an emerging technology, uh, none of these publications really agree with each other. Even publications from the same people, you can see, do not agree with each other because they were done in different times with different technologies, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and uh, different nodes also. Uh, as a result, you're left with uh, making some choices in terms of what you should use to have a realistic simulation uh, or real, as best as possible in terms of realistic simulation. The good thing in simulation is you can simulate a range of parameters, right? Uh, and that range of parameters can give you bounds. But we wanted to look at the most uh, realistic uh, device that you could do based on some, uh, some of our projections as well. Uh, so we actually used all of this data. Uh, so for example, you can see uh, that read time is 70 nanoseconds according to this estimation. It's 68 nanoseconds according to this. It's 48 nanoseconds according to this. Uh, you can see uh, the set time uh, varies a lot. It's 400 and nanoseconds here, it's 100 nanoseconds here. That's four orders of magnitude, even 80 nanoseconds over here. That's five, well, not uh, five X uh, uh, difference, not orders of magnitude clearly. So there's significant difference in terms of the projections of different uh, papers, even reset current, for example, many of the papers agree, but one of them says 90 over here, micrograms uh, as opposed to 600. Okay. Uh, okay. So basically we uh, did our best to actually derive some parameters for a feature size of 90 nanometers because we thought 90 nanometers was the most stable. And then uh, we wanted to understand uh, what those parameters are. So let me tell you what, the, what are the parameters we're going to use uh, to uh, simulate the replacement of DRAM. And uh, this chart actually uh, gives you a higher level bird's eye picture of where phase change memory actually sits. So you can see these are the uh, typical access latency of different technologies in terms of processor cycles for a four gigahertz processor. And you can see that SRAM is over here, embedded DRAM last level cache is over here, DRAM is somewhere over here. Page change memory is very close to DRAM, but uh, there is still uh, 2X to 4X and maybe more difference uh, because this is again an estimation. So this is from a different paper that is a little bit more optimistic than the paper that uh, I'm going to discuss now. Uh, and flash is somewhere over here. There's a huge difference between DRAM and flash, as you can see, and hard drive is somewhere over here. Okay, so I keep this in mind. This is the bigger picture, and that bigger picture is very, very important. So phase change memory can be a replacement for a main, main, main memory system, or can be a part of main memory system, as you can see, based on the latencies that we observe. So that's latency. Basically, read latency is about 4x of DRAM, according to what we're going to use. Uh, and it's three orders of magnitude faster than NAND flash, which is good. Write latency is 12x of DRAM, uh, which is not so good. Uh, write bandwidth is less than DRAM, similar to flash. Uh, so which is also not good, as you can see. Uh, so none of these are good, actually, compared to DRAM. Uh, dynamic energy is actually, uh, to, for reads, it's 2x of DRAM. And for writes, it's 43 times of DRAM. Because remember, writes are actually setting or resetting the cells. And you need high temperatures for this. And dynamic energy is similar to flash, actually. Endurance is a problem with phase change memory. Writes induce phase change at very high temperatures. And uh, at, at so high temperatures, contacts degrade from thermal expansion and contraction. And if you do it enough times, you basically uh, uh, make the contacts not working, essentially. And that's an endurance problem, wear out problem, in other words. And we, we're going to assume that you can only do a 10 to the 8 number of writes per cell. Clearly, this is a distribution. And modern uh, flash memory has this problem also. In flash memory, is actually it's it's much worse. You can do about three thousand writes per cell today. And actually, in 
in uh, in TLC technologies, uh, let's say you store eight bits per cell, you can do much less. Uh, well, in in planar technologies, you can do much less. In three D uh, flash, you can do much better today because three D flash enables you to uh, increase the size of your cell. Uh, but basically, it's a similar problem as flash memory. Uh, the reason why this happens is a little bit different, uh, but still, the problem is. Uh, the high level problem from an architectural perspective is endurance, wear out. Uh, so normally what uh, flash memory controllers do is they try to wear level, meaning lower the wear out of different cells, which means that they, uh, whenever you're writing to a cell, that write is redirected to some other location. So you remap uh, the address to some other location so that the physical wear of different uh, locations are uh, balanced. Clearly, this requires an address translation layer in the flash translation layer in, in SSD controller. And a similar thing is needed for phase change memory, unfortunately. So you need to have some sort of address translation layer to ensure that this wear is leveled across different cells in phase change memory. So that automatically makes phase change memory a little bit slower. And that's one of the reasons why Intel 3D X point is slower, uh, because you need to have, if you don't have this wear leveling, uh, you can actually, you're, you become subject to wear out attacks. So it becomes a security problem. And also your memory can actually get destroyed relatively quickly. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can see that uh, the assumption is, of DRAM is DRAM uh, doesn't have endurance problems, which may or may not be true. I think it's going to become much worse over time also. Uh, but for all practical reasons, we don't see endurance problems in DRAM. You can keep writing to DRAM cell and nothing happens. Uh, at least you hope nothing happens. Maybe we're not doing enough writes to show that today. I don't know. Uh, uh, but over time, that may change. But clearly, with phase change memory, uh, we are much worse. You can do 10 to the 8 writes per cell, which is much better than flash. But still, if you want to replace DRAM, you need to be able to sustain the number of writes that you do to main memory. And this is going to be a big issue, how to, how to handle endurance. Essentially, writes are very problematic, as you can see. Right, uh, Whenever you write to a cell, it uh, degrades a cell. Whenever you write to a cell, you consume a lot of energy, 43x of DRAM, uh, go back. Whenever you write to a cell, the latency is very long uh, and your bandwidth is also very bad. <laughs> so this is a memory that you should not write a lot to. Let me put it that way. So uh, maybe uh, if, if you're writing a lot, space change memory may not be a good uh, option, let's say. The big advantage of phase change memory is a cell size, essentially. Essentially, you can actually have much higher density than DRAM uh, and much higher density, even higher dens uh, density than uh, de NAND, essentially. And this can scale with feature size and multi-level cell. OK, so you can read the papers that I discussed for more analyses of why these things happen. Uh, but architecturally, let's uh, summarize. These are the pros and cons of phase change memory over DRAM. You get better technology scaling, hopefully higher capacity and cost over time. You're non-volatile as a result, uh, it's persistent memory, which means that you can actually manipulate uh, data as if you're manipulating data on a disk, but it's much better because this is byte addressable memory. Basically, you can manipulate a byte. You can write into uh, memory and uh, change a byte in a file automatically, and this will automatically persist, assuming you have the right abstraction levels and software uh, to be able to do this right in a persistent manner. This is beautiful, I think. This doesn't exist in any other technology. In DRAM, clearly it doesn't exist. In SSDs, clearly it doesn't exist. In, uh, because in SSDs, uh, you, don't, you cannot manipulate a single byte, at least in the way flash memory is organized and designed today. You have to manipulate an entire uh, uh, page whenever you write to a page, for example. Uh, that's true for hard disk also. Hard disk, the granularity is also, uh, a, let's say, a page granularity. It's really, uh, yeah, a block. Uh, in, in a hard disk. So having byte addressable, non-volatile, or persistent memory could be very useful if the applications can take advantage of it, for example. And we will discuss that later on. Uh, uh, low idle power, as we discussed, there is no need for refresh. This is another big pro over DRAM. And this is clearly a pro, because this uh, refresh problem doesn't exist in phase change memory, which is a big scaling problem with DRAM, as we discussed. OK, so these are the greens. But you also have reds. And the reds are actually pretty substantial. So you get higher latencies, uh, 4 to 15x of DRAM, especially write latencies are very bad. Uh, 
uh, and higher active energies, two to 50x of the EM, and that's the range, especially right energies are really bad. You get lower endurance, a cell dies after 10 to the eight number of rights. Uh, I think this has become a little bit better, but not much better, maybe 10 to the nine. Uh, reliability issues are unfortunate. I'm not gonna cover a lot of these, but you should keep this in mind. There are a bunch of reliability issues, some of which are known, some of which are may not be known yet because the technology is not scaled to, I don't know, 10 nanometers, for example, today, uh, we will see. But one issue is resistance drift. Essentially, just like charge leaks, resistance drifts. Meaning that if you program the cell to be high resistance, over time, it becomes lower resistance. Uh, this happens for multiple reasons I'm not gonna get into, but you can think of this as a charge leakage problem. The, pro the, dif the difference is it's not as bad as the EM uh, because uh, th there's a huge resistance range, first of all, and uh, the, the time scale at which it happens is much uh, higher, larger granularity than 64 milliseconds, essentially, or milliseconds. This happens at a, a much larger granularity. As a result, the refresh that you need to do or resistance fi fixing that you need to do doesn't need to be uh, very often. But you still need to take this into account. And there are other reliability issues like write disturbance, uh, potentially read disturbance, like row hammer type of errors uh, are also issues, but I'm not going to discuss them since uh, there's not Clearly, these issues cannot be easily studied without having real devices at hand. Okay, so clearly there are challenges in enabling phase change memory as a DRM replacement or helper. We want to mitigate the reds as much as possible. Uh, we want to take advantage of greens as much as possible, and we want to find the right way to place phase change memory in the system. And when we first started looking into phase change memory, our idea was exactly that, basically. Where should phase change memory go? And that was a system on the left uh, at, we had at that time. We still have something like this, but now we have actually potential patients memory too. Uh, we said that over time, some of the EM will be replaced with PCM. So you will have hybrid memory that's controlled in some way. Uh, and we're going to get back to this actually. Other folks actually examined this earlier and they found out that this actually can have a lot of benefit. And I agree with that. Uh, the, the issue becomes how to partition and migrate data between patients memory and DRAM. Uh, but we were a lot more aggressive and we said that, let's take a look at what happens if we replace DRAM completely with phase change memory and not have DRAM in the system. This is pure phase change memory, main memory. And the question becomes, how do you redesign the entire hierarchy and the cores and phase change memory chips to overcome the shortcomings, reds of the PCM while uh, taking advantage of the greens as much as possible. And that's not going to be easy. And that's what this paper is about basically. I mean, it doesn't cover uh, how to redesign the entire hierarchy, but it, it does do a redesign of the PCM chips to minimize the shortcomings as much as possible. So what we did was surveyed PERT types, uh, as I discussed earlier, uh, and we derived some parameters. And these are the parameters that we're going to use in our simulation. Density is not going to matter because we're going to assume uh, the same size DRAM as PCM. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate what happens to performance and energy and uh, lifetime of memory uh, if you take DRAM out of the system and replace it with phase change memory. And the way we're going to do it is going to be very particular. We're going to take every single DRAM cell out in the system and replace it with phase change memory with the characteristics that we have over here. Uh, so we're not going to uh, try to say, okay, if you replace DRAM, your capacity with phase change memory will increase. Clearly that will make the results better for phase change memory, right? But we're going to be equal capacity comparison even though over time, we expect phase change memory will have much higher capacity, okay? So this is a pessimistic comparison in that sense, but it's, I think, important to do the sort of pessimistic comparisons because density, uh, yes, you can take advantage of it, uh, but you can only do better than this uh, pessimistic comparison. And the latencies we're gonna assume are what we discussed earlier. The read latencies are 4X DM, write latencies are 12X, and endurance and energy you can see over here. So let's take a look at the results. Uh, clearly, if you're an architect, you can do the simulation really easily. And that's what it is, essentially. We replace DRAM with phase change memory in a four core, four megabyte L2 system. And we organize PCM the same way as DRAM, row buffers, banks, and peripherals. And we simulate a bunch of workloads. These happen to be some scientific workloads. For example, this one's an earthquake simulation. Uh, this one's FFT, as you can see. Uh, there are multi grade workloads, conjugate gradients, et cetera. Uh, shallow water modeling, et cetera. These are interesting applications. And basically we look at what happens to performance, what happens to energy and what happens to lifetime. And the results don't look good basically. On average, 
the performance degrades by 60%, energy increases by 120%, and the memory dies after 500 hours. This sounds terrible, right? Clearly, this is not a technology that you want. In some cases, it's actually much worse. In some cases, the performance degrades, like if you look over here, actually this is energy. Energy degrades by 240% and performance degrade by 120% over here, right? That doesn't sound good. And these may not be the most memory intensive applications, although they're quite memory intensive reasonably. So uh, we said this is not good clearly. So what can we do to mitigate the shortcomings of DRAM? And the idea is, as I said earlier, this is a memory that doesn't like writes much. You want to minimize the writes as much as possible. You want to reduce the reads also, but reads are not as bad, but writes are really bad for this sort of memory. Uh, I mean, uh, in the end, we want to minimize the writes and we want to uh, minimize the reads on top of that also. So basically, this is a memory that you don't want to uh, use as your past memory. Uh, it could be a backing store, a fast backing store for your DM, but uh, maybe it should not, uh, you should not uh, write or read too, uh, much from it. That's my joke about it. Uh, if you're replacing DRAM, of course. If, you put, if you're replacing an SSD with phase change memory, then it becomes much better, right? Uh, the comparison looks much better. But DRAM is a difficult technology to replace. OK, so basically, uh, what we do in this case is uh, two ideas. We, uh, in DRAM, for example, you have sense amplifiers, right, which is row buffer. And you know about that a lot. And the size of the row buffer is exactly the size of a row, let's say two kilobytes. In phase change memory, it doesn't have to be that way. Why? Because in DRAM, your sense amplifiers have to be the same size as your row buffer because whenever you read a single cell, you, you, whenever you activate a row, you activate all of the cells. And if you don't sense all of the cells and write them back through the sense amplification and uh, restoration, cell restoration process, you lose data on some cells. So your sense amplifier by nature has to be uh, the same size as your row. You cannot just say, I'm going to, I'm going to sense only four cells out of the two kilobyte row. No, that doesn't happen because what happens is you will lose uh, the remaining uh, two kilobyte minus four cells. Why? Because you didn't sense them and you didn't restore them, even though you activated them, right? So because DRAM is wallet, uh, DRAM is, reads are destructive, uh, you have to have a sense amplifier that's as uh, wide as your row. In phase change memory, that's not the case. A read is not destructive. Basically, whenever you read, you activate the word line, OK? You don't sense the cell, that's fine. The data will still stay there because it's non-volatile, remember? Uh, so you can only sense the cells that you care about, basically. And that reduces the cost of phase change memory a little bit. You don't need to have a huge number of sense amplifiers. And what we do in this case is basically we reorganize the DM sense amplifiers to uh, smaller uh, but more latches. Now you can actually buffer uh, many of different parts of a phase change memory, if you will. That's the idea over here. So for example, if you have two kilobyte uh, buffer for a single row over here, you may decide to have two kilobyte divided by 64 bits, which is a lot of buffers, a lot of latches over here. Uh, but now you can actually buffer things that you may really need potentially, right? That's the idea. And now this acts as a cache. Uh, and uh, this reduces array reads and writes at the same time. And that leads to better endurance, better latency, and better energy, because most of the time you're not accessing the data array. So that's the idea, basically. You reorganize a peripheral circuitry, the sense amplifiers or the row buffers, such that you minimize the reads and writes into the data array. Because writing into the data array is terrible, as we discussed. Reading from the data array is also bad. So try to handle almost all of the accesses, if possible, of course, in the on-chip structures that are not part of the data array. Because these are SRAM, as we've discussed. Sense amplifiers in DRAM are uh, cross-coupled inverters, which are the basic building structure of SRAM circuits, as we also discussed, right? So this is going to be very similar to DRAM sensing circuitry, except it's organized in a different way. That sounds good, right? And the memory control now man can manage this uh, as a cache uh, nicely to minimize reads and writes into the array. The second idea is, uh, again, trying to minimize writes uh, into the array. Uh, this is specialized to writes. Basically, whenever you write into the array, uh, you don't write at the granularity of cache block. Uh, you don't write at the granularity of a row, but you write at the granularity of a cache block or even lower or word, basically. 
And this reduces unnecessary wear. Basically, write into the array only cells that are going to change. And that's the idea. And you can do that select the write and page change memory arrays, which I'm not going to discuss here, but you can read the papers related to it. So clearly, this reduces unnecessary wear on cells that did not change. OK. And later, Samsung has actually implemented some of these ideas, and that made phase change memory much better. Uh, and let's take a look, look at the results over here. Basically, if you actually do all of this that I discussed, for the workloads that we examined, the outlook looks much better. Basically, the performance uh, uh, loss compared to DRAM becomes only 20% as opposed to 60%, which is still not so great, as you can see, 20%. But it's more palatable than 60% on average. Uh, but there are some workloads that actually see much higher, as you can see. Energy becomes on par with DRAM. Take this with a grain of salt. We don't have the best energy models. Uh, the static energy is a big issue. So because static energy reduces a lot, uh, there's no refresh. Uh, there's a big benefit over energy, but maybe our energy models were not the best also. Uh, so I think this is a bit aggressive in terms of its projection, but clearly it's better than 2.2x. And lifetime becomes much better than 500 hours. Basically, average, average lifetime when memory dies is 5.6 years now, which is much more palatable. And hopefully, we argued in the paper that technology scaling in phase change memory improves energy, improves density, and improves endurance. That's the hope. Now, uh, the caveats are not so good, basically. Worst case lifetime is actually much shorter. You can see in some of these workloads over here, worst case lifetime is less than a year. Actually, it's around a year if you do this uh, optimization that we discussed, which is uh, writing into the array in terms of uh, words. But still, a year is not good. Uh, depending on the intensity workload, write intensity of the workload, you can get a year or maybe not get a year. In some cases, you get much more, of course. Uh, but I think uh, this is not so reliable, clearly, right? Uh, uh, caveat two is intensive applications see much worse large uh, energy and performance uh, uh, degradations. So if your application becomes even more intensive, this memory is going to behave worse, which is also not good, clearly. And maybe we use optimistic phase change memory parameters. Uh, and that, I think, may also be true compared to what we see in 3D X point today. 3D X point is actually much worse than what we have seen, I think, what we have assumed in our work. Uh, but I think uh, our research is clearly well ahead uh, of 3D X point, at least 10 years ahead. Uh, and I believe 3D X point is not an optimized version of, it's really the uh, first version of uh, a phase change memory product as main memory. So I believe over time, 3D X point will improve as well. So basically, the, this outlook doesn't look good. So we were pessimistic clearly in some things, we were optimistic in some things, but these caveats uh, are not very good. So someone can launch an attack, for example, that keeps writing to memory and that can destroy your memory much earlier than 5.6 years and you have no control over it. So you need to be able to prevent that. Uh, and intensive applications suffer. And if you use optimistic PCM parameters, they suffer even more. Uh, so the problem is basically we are re replacing DRAM completely with phase change memory. It's a very bold move clearly, but maybe it's also not the right move at least currently, as the technology stands, because maybe this technology is not yet ready for replacing DRAM completely. Uh, clearly, the technology is not yet ready for exposing all of the rights, memory rights, to it, because rights uh, are really problematic in this technology. Reads are also problematic, but maybe you don't want to expose all of your rights and reads to this memory, basically. That's the, that's the takeaway from these results. So, okay. So if you're interested, this is going to be one of your readings. Uh, this was published in 2009. As I said, the work was done over the course of two years in 2007, 2009. Uh, and uh, the paper, I hope, has a lot of valuable data uh, points. Uh, and it's really a precursor uh, to 3D X point in an architectural perspective. Uh, clearly, Intel was doing a lot of research and IBM was doing a lot of research and other companies like Micron uh, they were also doing a lot of research. At the same time, we were doing this architectural research, but they were doing research at a much more different level, basically. Uh, they were doing research at the device level and circuit level to make this work. We were doing research on how can we enable in, a, in an architectural way, which is all, all, all important. They're all important research, I think. And if you, uh, there's a shorter version of this article that was selected as uh, top picks from architecture conferences that you can also take a look at. This actually has more techniques because uh, we actually 
collaborated with other folks from University of Pittsburgh when we wrote this article. So the good news is, uh, I mean, these papers are clearly much older, right? Uh, uh, today, this one's 10 years old and the other is 11 years old, but the research that went into it was 13 years old, let's say. But the good news is the idea uh, that we had in mind was realized by Intel in 2019, clearly. And this is the memory dim that Intel, we, also, we already talked about it in a different context, clearly, but this is the memory dim that Intel put into the field that you can buy right now. You have to pay a lot for it, yes, but you can buy uh, non-volatile main memory right now based on 3D exploit technology, which is very, very likely phase change memory. And you can see that this has a very high uh, capacity, which is good. And you don't know what's inside. Basically, there's some controller inside, and but you it it it's uh, it uses the DDR protocol, uh, and uh, it's good basically. Uh, well, actually, I think the protocol is a little bit uh, proprietary. Let's say to what Intel uh, does. That's why it's Intel's technology. So uh, you cannot put it on any uh, processor, uh, as far as I know, unless you somehow hack and figure out what the. Uh, uh, what the protocol is and design a machine that uses that protocol somehow. Uh, but basically, this is very good news, I think. Uh, we, we uh, 13 years ago, we believed in some technology and we tried to enable it. We looked at different ways of uh, doing it. And uh, hopefully, uh, well, uh, 10, uh, more than 10 years later, the technology is enabled now. Now it will only get better, in my opinion. Uh, uh, because uh, the uh, because the uh, technology itself is going to improve, the manufacturing itself is going to improve, etc. So this is going to get better, in my opinion, over time. So there's one question: Doesn't this mean that they must have overcome the right endurance problem? So uh, yes, uh, they have to have overcome the right endurance problem in some way. Uh, internally, I think they do a lot of tricks inside the controller over here. Uh, to ensure that, and that's one of the reasons why it's proprietary, I think. Uh, internally, I believe there's a lot of over-provisioning they have. Uh, I, I mean, they don't disclose this information, but I believe internally they, uh, they employ techniques uh, that uh, are similar to flash memory, uh, which has a much worse right endurance problem. Of course, in flash memory, the right endurance problem is much worse, but you don't write a lot into flash memory also because it's storage, it's not memory. Here, your right endurance problem, the number of writes you can do is uh, much higher, but you do a lot of writes also into your main memory. So they, they employ a lot of tricks internally to be able to do that. I believe they employ sophisticated error correcting codes internally for various reasons, not just write endurance. Uh, they employ, I think, uh, over uh, amplification, meaning uh, 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 they basically do some remapping. I think they do very leveling. Uh, they, they, I, I believe also they do, again, uh, this is not on the basis of any confidential information or uh, 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 or anything else like that, but uh, there, there are works that show that you need to employ very leveling. In fact, in our work, uh, we showed that you need to employ very leveling uh, to even get to the numbers that we discussed. So internally, you need to employ a lot of things to make this work. And endurance is one of the issues, clearly. Uh, how good it is, I don't know. I mean, uh, it depends, of course, on uh, somebody needs to evaluate the endurance. I, I, I'm not aware of any studies that looked at endurance. I, I know of studies that looked at latencies, uh, which are not good compared to the um, latencies and bandwidth, which are not good. It's, they're not even as good as what we had assumed, for example, because of these reasons, I think. Internally, they need to do a lot, uh, and that impacts your latency internally also. Uh, OK, uh, so that's a good question, basically. But I think over time, uh, these will become better. And clearly, this is better than flash memory because there's a version of this uh, that is supposed to replace the storage as well. So you can buy a version of Optane SSD. I think it's called Optane SSD, actually. Uh, uh, you, can, you can buy it and replace your SSD, and it's much faster. So replacing flash is easy, actually, with this technology. But replacing DRAM is harder. OK, so let's go into a little bit more before we take a break. Basically. Uh, this is another work that we have done uh, on uh, phase change memory based main memory. And I want to discuss just a little bit of this. I'm not going to discuss the ideas. There are a lot of interesting ideas in this work, I think, uh, that talks about uh, how to do mapping and buffering to take advantage of the uh, latency and energy asymmetry in phase change, in multi level cell phase change memories. But I'm going to just talk about the asymmetry. And I'm going to refer you to the paper if you're interested in more details. Uh, 
so basically, uh, the idea is some phase change might be best to take longer to read, as we've discussed, right? If you have a multi-level cell, it takes longer to read uh, some cells. And this is uh, a picture from the paper. Uh, and this is one of the ways you actually read uh, the, uh, the phase change memory cells. Uh, so for example, uh, in this case, uh, if you want to read two bits, if it fits a two level cell, uh, you have four, well, it's not, I shouldn't call it two level cells. It's a two bit cell. Uh, you store two bits in a cell. You have four different levels in terms of uh, voltage. And basically, this is one way of reading from phase change memory. You basically have reference voltages for each of them. And you compare the bit line voltage to the reference voltage and then decide uh, uh, whether you have a 0 or 1. But to be able to distinguish between, let's say, 0, 0 and 0, 1, it takes much longer over time. You basically need to compare it to multiple different reference voltages over here, as we discussed earlier. I'm going to show you an animation a little bit. So reading both of the bits take much longer than reading the first bit. So in order to be able to distinguish the first bit, which is the top bit over here, clearly you, know, you only need to read until T2, right? Because until, uh, the reference voltage that you use to read until T2 uh, is enough. Because you, you can read that uh, at this point, you know that the bit is 1 or 0, whatever it is, right? OK, that's the idea over here. So basically, you can take advantage of this architecturally, which I'm not going to go into exactly how. But I wanted to give you a, uh, this importance of single level cell or multi-level cell difference. Basically, read latency and energy of bit 1 is lower than that of bit 0. So there's this interesting asymmetry that you have, which you don't normally have in DRAM. And this is due to, well, you, you actually have this in a Flash also, uh, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. So this is due to how MLC PCM cells are read. Uh, read. So one example, one simplified example of how you read this, basically you have a reference voltage and you fill your capacity with the reference voltage and MLC PCM cell has unknown resistance. And you basically connect these things and you basically check uh, whether MLC PCM cell uh, is greater than or less than the reference voltage. So you basically, uh, depending on the voltage level that you have, uh, there, uh, that you have in this MLC PCM cell, your bit line stabilizes to a different level over here. Okay, and it takes different time basically. You infer the uh, data value after some time. Okay, so read asymmetry as we discussed in a multi-level cell, you encode the uh, 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 different uh, values uh, based on different levels of resistance, which uh, are also voltage in the end. So initial voltage uh, that you fill is fully charged capacitor over there. And when you, sell, when you connect the PCM cell to this capacitor that I mentioned over here, this is one way of reading, uh, you drain uh, the capacitor clearly. And depending on when the capacitor is drained, you know the data value, OK? Uh, that's one way of reading a PCM cell. So in this case, the capacitor is drained over here. And as a result, you see that the value is 0, 1, OK? Uh, but in, uh, both MLC bits are read at the same time in existing devices. Uh, so you must make the maximum time to read both of the bits. But you can actually infer information about bit 1 much before this time. So for example, uh, the time to determine bit 1's value, ignore bit 0 over here. Uh, the time to determine bit 1's value is over here. Time to determine bit 0's value is actually over here. So it can actually be much faster in determining bit 1 if, you, if what, that's what you really care about. And this work actually proposes a way to uh, map the data such that if you want to store two bits, you store in different rows and you store them in bit ones. And latency critical data can go to bit one, which can be determined much faster. Okay, so it's a cute trick, I think, uh, but the latency difference is actually much uh, very high uh, in terms of bit one versus bit zero. I think it's about two x. You can read the paper for more detail. Okay, uh, the similar similar asymmetry happens in terms of write. Uh, writes are actually a little bit more complicated. Whenever you write to a phase change memory cell, uh, you have an original state, and then you write some uh, bit value. Uh, so this is the original two-bit value, and you write, you go into another uh, two-bit value. And uh, depending on which transition you take, the original uh, data and the data that you're overwriting, your latencies can vary a lot, as you can see. So for example, going from this, 1, 1 to 1, 0 takes 0 0.2x value 
0.2x the latency of going from 0, 0.1 to 1, 0. Here, you're changing both of the bits, right? Here, you're changing only the LSP. That's why it's much faster. So there's a five times difference in terms of the latency. This is the worst case, going changing both of the bits. And also here, uh, this is also the worst case. So you can, there are reasons for it that I'm not going to go into. You can read in this paper. But uh, there is a huge difference in terms of uh, the latency asymmetry and also energy asymmetry, uh, which we didn't really talk about. But it take, clearly, draining a capacitor takes much longer. Draining, uh, draining a, a capacitor much longer takes much more energy over here. Uh, and you can read the cell, uh, this bit much faster, and also with lower energy. And that's true over here. Uh, going from this transition to this transition leads to much lower latency and lower energy, uh, much higher latency and higher energy. Whereas this transition to this transition leads to much lower latency and lower energy. And you can take advantage of this also. And again, I'm not going to go into details of how you can take advantage of it. So you can read the paper that I just uh, flashed over here on this slide. Uh, and this could be one of the papers uh, that we uh, write as uh, give you as a bonus paper in one of your homework. And I think this is actually fascinating. This takes things to a, a next step clearly uh, than uh, what we've discussed so far. Now you can go and optimize the device itself, as we've been doing with flash memory, and as we've been doing with DRAM also. But clearly, this is a very distinguishing uh, optimization that you do in phase change memory. There are similar issues in flash, but um, they're not maybe as well studied as uh, it was done in this work. OK, let me talk uh, a little bit more. Uh, I think I will stop at hybrid memory, uh, and then uh, we will take a break. Uh, so phase change memory is clearly not the only uh, memory technology that's a contender uh, for uh, replacing, potentially replacing or augmenting DRAM. There are other technologies. STTMRAM is one of them. We picked phase change memory because we believe that at the time we were studying it, it was closest to manufacturability, let's say. Uh, and I think we were right in the end. The, uh, the, the first, actually, the first uh, commercial technology that was manufactured is not phase change memory, it's SCTM. And there's a company called Everspin Technologies. Uh, and with some NDA, you can buy their chips, STTM chips. Uh, and their chips are actually relatively large. But that they're also very, very costly, I believe. Uh, and the reason is what we're going to see. STTM RAM is a very interesting technology, but the cell size is very large uh, today because it's a, it has not scaled yet. And there are some uh, barriers into its scaling that people need to put some effort. Uh, as, a, uh, as a result, it's not as dense as the phase change memory today. OK, so let's take a look at how this memory technology works. So basically, this is a magnetic memory. Uh, magnetic memories existed in the past, uh, but again, read devices uh, became much better for magnetic memories. Uh, so we're going to use what is called a magnetic tunnel junction device. And it looks like this uh, at, a, at some uh, bird's eye view. Basically, you have some magnets. Uh, actually, you have two magnets. Uh, one is called the reference layer. One is called the free layer. Uh, and the reference layer has a fixed magnetic orientation. Free layer can be parallel. Uh, to the magnetic uh, to the to the reference layer or anti-parallel to their magnetic layer uh, to the to the reference layer in terms of its magnetic orientation, and this uh, this uh, free layers magnetic orientation determines the logical state of the device. You basically get either low resistance here or high resistance here. Basically, I don't remember which one is which, but uh, that's what it is. Basically, one of them is high resistance, one of them is low resistance, and again, the resistance range is very large in this case. So it can actually have multi-level cell STTM RAM as well. So that's the idea, basically. It's very simple. Operational principle is very simple. In order to be able to write to the device, you need to change the free layer, clearly, free layer's orientation. And you need to push large current through the magnetic tunnel junction device, which is depicted like this. So you again, you have an excess transistor and a magnetic tunnel junction device over here. In order to read from this device, you need to sense the current flow. And the current flow is really different uh, between a logical zero or logical one, or depending on the magnetic orientation of the free layer, basically. And that's the idea. I'm not going to go into more details of how this is sensed, et cetera. You can read this paper uh, that we have written. And you can, this paper also references other STTM RAM papers. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting, clearly, but we don't have time to go into the device level details. And that's not the subject of this course, also. Our abstraction level does not cross the boundaries of the device, as we've discussed, although it's good to know the boundaries of the device for some studies. For some studies, you don't perhaps care. Uh, 
you know you just need to know the properties of the de device not the not how it exactly works but this is a very good abstraction to uh, think about how this device works okay now let's be architectural again and think about the pros and cons of this device over DRAM. so i'm going to compare it to over DRAM first first of all you get better technology scaling again get better capacity and cost because again this is resistive not charge based they're very similar to page change memory. All of these are very similar. You get non-volatility. So this could actually be used as persistent memory. Uh, and you also get low idle power because there is no refresh over here. OK, now here's some noise outside. Uh, I hope it's not coming from my room, but I don't see anything uh, particular here. OK, so the pros are very similar, uh, clearly, to page change memory. The cons are actually very nice. Well, some of the cons are very nice. Uh, so read latency is not a problem. You can make the read latency very similar to the DRAM. That's good. But write latencies are still high. Uh, write energies are still high. Reliability issues are problematic. Actually, there is a lot of read disturb issues in STTM RAM, similar to the DRAM. Uh, there, uh, endurance is not a problem, actually, uh, with this. So endurance is gone. So that's good. Uh, so you may say, why isn't this better than phase change memory strictly? Uh, and Assume, assuming all else being equal, it would have been better. But unfortunately, currently, it has very poor density. Uh, people have not figured out how to exactly uh, make this as dense as DRAM or even denser than DRAM in, in case of phase change memory, uh, because these magnets need to be relatively large. And if you actually, be becomes, if you actually push uh, them to be much smaller, then you run into some reliability issues, basically. So we need to see if we can overcome those reliability issues so as a result, uh, it's less promising than DRAM, uh, than, than phase change memory uh, currently. But who knows in the future, right? Some of these issues can be solved. Over time, scaling, there's no reason. Fundamentally, poor, poor density can go away. And this could scale to a very small technology node, assuming the reliability issues can be overcome, basically. Uh, there's also another level of freedom, which is very interesting. It also exists to some degree in phase change memory. But you can trade off non-volatility for lower right? latency and energy. You can reduce the size of this magnetic tunnel junction device, basically. Uh, and that leads to, well, you get rid of a non-volatility, basically. Uh, you still you need to refresh the device uh, to some degree, not as bad as DRAM. But your right latency is energy reduced because you, need, you don't need to push as much current into uh, this magnetic tunnel junction device to write into the device. So that's good, actually. So this becomes interesting because if you want to replace DRAM, maybe you want actually non-volatility over here. Okay. Now this is an optimization that you cannot do dynamically today, unfortunately, uh, but you can do statically. So a part of your memory, STTM RAM memory, can be non-volatile. Part of it can be volatile. Uh, so it could be nice actually from that perspective. You can have a heterogeneous volatility uh, memory uh, if this is your optimization freedom that you have. Okay. So STTM RAM is interesting as a DRAM replacement, but it's also very interesting as a cache replacement today. People are looking into replacing SRAM caches or embedded DRAM caches with STTM RAM because poor density is not that big of a problem in cache because the size of SRAM is already 30 to 40, an SRAM cell is already 30 to 40 times the size of a DRAM cell, maybe more. And STTM RAM is in the same ballpark, actually. The, same, the size of an STTM RAM cell is 30 to 40 times the size of a DRAM cell today. So it's in the same ballpark. And people have been looking into replacing large last level caches uh, with STTM RAM technology, whatever they are today, SRAM or embedded DRAM. Uh, STTM RAM is more scalable, basically. Well, embedded DRAM, unfortunately, is still uh, 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 higher density. So STTM RAM is, does a little bit worse than MD, uh, embedded DRAM. Uh, but it's clearly uh, much better in terms of uh, well, similar, let's say, in terms of capacity to SRAM. And their latencies can be similar. Uh, of course, write latencies are still problematic. So it can have a non-volatile cache, basically. If you have some non-volatile on-chip storage, uh, it could be a cache. It could be a scratch pad. It could be very useful, basically. That's why STTMM is very promising. STTMM can be integrated relatively easily with CMOS technology also. So that's another reason why it's uh, very promising. OK. So uh, what we did in this study is actually looked at architect architecting STTM RAM as main memory, very similar to what we did uh, with the phase change memory study a few years ago, uh, earlier than this, of course. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail over here. But basically, you need to architect the STTM RAM uh, to uh, uh, 
essentially we're going to replace DRAM uh, with uh, with SCTM RAM, but uh, to, you need to handle writes well. Uh, so uh, write latencies, you need to do the buffering well, and you need to actually minimize the writes into this memory also. And if you do those, as you could read in this paper, uh, you get actually much better results compared to phase change memory. So assuming equal size, DRAM and STTM RAM, you get about 6% performance loss, which is not bad. And you get about 60% energy savings compared to DRAM, which is also quite good, actually, as you can see. I mean, take this with a grain of salt. All of the energy models are potentially flawed and potentially problematic. Uh, but again, uh, in simulation, and especially energy simulation, things are not easy also, because clearly this is not a manufactured technology. And how do you calibrate it uh, with the real devices? Well, we don't have that calibration. So only thing we can do is actually rely on lower level circuit models uh, and do our best uh, to get the best circuit model uh, and simulate the energy. Uh, again, 60% is clearly promising, right? Because if this was 6%, okay, maybe it's in the noise. If it was it's 60%, okay, maybe even if the noise is 30%, then uh, you still have a good advantage, right? So, okay, this technology looks very promising to replace DRAM compared to phase change memory, at least directly replacing DRAM, right? Because your performance loss is not that bad and your energy savings is a lot. And I think that's true. There's a lot of promise, but as I said, there's a big caveat with STTM RAM. Your capacity assumptions are not, do not hold, basically. The capacity is not as good as DRAM, unfortunately, today for a given area cost, which means that if you want to get these numbers, assuming these numbers are correct completely, if you want to get them, you need to pay a lot more cost for them. But over time, hopefully, those issues will be resolved, and we will see uh, what happens to STTM RAM. And if you're interested, you can read this paper where we covered STTM RAM. Uh, okay, this said, I think going forward, we really want hybrid main memories. And uh, basically, uh, since none of these technologies that we've discussed are green at every metric, uh, they all have some greens and some reds, and other technologies have some other greens and some other reds. I think having hybrid memory systems is a very viable approach going into the future. Uh, because it gets the best of multiple, it has the potential to get the best of multiple technologies as with any approach that employs heterogeneity. But then the key question becomes, how do you redesign the system to get the greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible? And that's going to be what we're going to discuss next in a little bit. But this is, going to, this, this is an area where there's been a lot of research uh, that has been done, but there's more research that needs to be done. We're gonna cover a bunch of ideas. Uh, and I think uh, here the imagination and creativity can become uh, very uh, good because this doesn't have to be DRAM plus phase change memory, right? Even though we're going to see instances of those to begin with, this can be DRAM and other types of DRAM. This could be DRAM, phase change memory, uh, STTM RAM, flash memory, maybe some SRAM, et cetera. Basically, you could run, let your imagination run wild. Uh, which is a good thing to do in computer architecture if you're imagining the future system 20 years down, down the road. And maybe you can find really good solutions. Of course, with heterogeneity, there's always the issue of complexity and cost. And that's, uh, that's uh, basically the cost we're going to pay. Clearly, there is a complexity and cost issue with hybrid memory systems. And uh, you cannot overcome that, unfortunately. You, need to, you, can, min you can try to minimize that, but it's, this is going to be costly for sure. But you may have a much more scalable main memory. You may actually have, I don't know, 100 terabytes of main memory, for example, if you actually have the sort of scaling uh, with some additional cost and complexity that's associated with it. So we're going to talk about this next. And this is a very general concept, as we've discussed. And the key challenge and opportunity is, how do you provide the best of multiple metrics, greens as much as possible, uh, with multiple different memory technologies? And this leads us to heterogeneous or hybrid uh, memory systems. And I believe to take advantage of heterogeneity, you want configurability in the memory system, in the memory controller. You want to configure the mapping of different data. Uh, you want to be able to say, this data gets mapped here, this data gets mapped here. And you want to be able to migrate data. You want different sort of configurability. And we will see different sort of conf configurability also later on. And I believe you want programmability also. Essentially, as I told you earlier, this requires some intelligent memory controllers. Programmability, because you can actually take much better advantage of 
the different types of memories if, you have, if you're programmable. So intelligence and the memory control are going to become a big uh, thing here, as we will see in the works that we're going to examine. Okay, so I think this is a good place to take a break. Let's stop here and take a, uh, okay, let's get back, I think, uh, at 2.50. Let's take a 15 minute break. And then we're gonna cover uh, hybrid memory systems quite a bit. And then hopefully we'll get to covering uh, opportunities, different opportunities with emerging memory technologies. Like uh, we're gonna talk uh, about how to better do computation memory and also can we have a single level store where most of your memory is directly exposed, persistent memory is directly exposed to, uh, uh, to your programs and can you take advantage of that? Okay, uh, so this is a good place to uh, stop. I'm going to stop sharing and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Okay, let's get started uh, with the second part of the lecture. So uh, recall that we uh, are we're talking about hybrid main memory. So I'm going to jog your memory with these slides. Uh, essentially, we would like to guess the, get the best of multiple technologies with hybrid main memory. Uh, and this requires hybrid, configurable, and programmable memory systems, as we discussed. There are many issues over here, actually, in addition to um, configurability and programmability, which we're not going to talk a lot about. Uh, but uh, a hybrid memory uh, system actually creates a huge design space. Uh, the question uh, now becomes which memory acts as a cache, which memory is the real main memory? For example, if you have a DRAM and PCM uh, memory, are they both parts of main memory or is one of them a cache for the other one? And we're going to look at the cache option for DRAM, uh, but both can be main memories also. There have been designs uh, that have been proposed that way. What is the granularity of data movement or management? between the two memories, because you may want to move data between the two memories to uh, provide the best of uh, all, both worlds, right? Uh, and, and that movement, uh, if it's large granularity, if it's page granularity, for example, four kilobytes or eight kilobytes all the time, that caused a lot of churn. Uh, there's a lot of bandwidth overhead. If it's finer granularity, then there could be a lot of benefit over here. Uh, who manages the memories, hardware or software? or hardware software cooperative? This is a very good question. I think usually hardware software cooperative is a good option. Uh, hard, pure hardware management is also possible if it's a, a cache that's not visible, for example, to the software. If DRAM becomes a cache that's not visible to the software, only the memory control may allocate data in it. There's actually a lot of uh, interesting things that are here. Uh, all of these things are very interesting, especially within the context of the virtual block interface that we have talked about a few weeks ago, which is a new way of thinking about virtual memory by delegating the virtual memory functions to the memory controller, right? If you have a heterogeneous memory system, you actually may want a lot of the virtual memory functions like memory allocation functions and address translation functions allocated to your memory controller because your memory controller can have more information to actually manage multiple different types of memory. When do you migrate data? We're gonna talk briefly about that. When do you decide which data should be placed in which memory? And uh, if you use one of the memories as a cache, it can be a huge cache, right? One gigabyte, for example, or even larger, four gigabytes, potentially. How do you design a scalable and efficient large cache? How do you build a tag store for it? Uh, and how do you uh, manage it, basically? And there are many, many other questions that I don't have over here. These are some specific questions, of course. There are other questions like, how do you uh, inform the hardware about uh, potential uh, memories to allocate? Uh, data structures into. Again, their a virtual block interface could be useful over there. Uh, or, or what kind of memories do you want to put in? And uh, what are the reliability characteristics? What are the different characteristics? So clearly there's a lot more than what we're, go what we're going to discuss. So let's talk about one option, which is uh, DRAM being used as a cache for phase change memory, because it's one of the earliest options. In this case, phase change memory is main memory and DRAM caches memory rows or blocks. And the big benefit is you get reduced latency on DRAM cache hits in this case. And a DRAM can actually also act as a write buffer, let's say, to PCM. Basically, uh, PCM doesn't get exposed to all of the writes and all of the reads, hopefully. That's the goal over here. Uh, and uh, memory controller hardware manages the DRAM cache, and this eliminates the system software overhead. This is basically, if you, if you had to manage uh, the DRAM cache with system software, it would be very slow 
in fact, today's SSDs are uh, managed with system software and people are realizing that it's probably not a good idea to actually have so much system software overhead uh, when the device is very fast. This will become more of an issue uh, when, when we discuss uh, later uh, single level stores, but keep this in mind. Uh, so DM cache, I think if, if you have a hardware managed cache, it's much faster than a software managed cache in this case. So there are three issues that we're going to discuss. What uh, data should be placed in DM versus kept in PCM, assuming DM is a cache? What is the granularity of data movement between DM and PCM? And how do you design a low cost hardware managed DM cache? And there are two idea directions. One is locality of our data placement, which we will discuss. And the other is making the tax stores cheap and having dynamic granularity, as we will also discuss. So I'm going to give you the major ideas. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but hopefully major ideas will be clear if you're really interested in the detailed mechanisms. Detailed mechanisms are actually much more sophisticated than the major ideas that go into them. Uh, because you need to take into account multiple things like endurance. You need to take into account the right read differences in terms of uh, latency and energy, et cetera. So uh, the, the, you know, eventually the implemented mechanisms need to take those into account, whereas the basic idea is one big component that drives uh, the mechanism. OK, so let's take a look at DM as a cache for page change memory. Uh, the, the, in the same, at the same time, we published our work. Uh, this work was published in the same conference. Ours was the first paper in the conference. The other one, this one was the second paper in the conference. And this uh, paper actually is uh, similar to ours in a sense, but it's, it's taking a, a different perspective uh, in terms of how should DRAM uh, be replaced uh, by PCM. Basically, it's not getting rid of DRAM. Uh, from that perspective, it's not as aggressive, but uh, it, it also shows that uh, D, uh, having some amount of DRAM in the system actually alleviates a lot of the issues that PCM has. So basically, the goal of this work is to achieve the best of DRAM and page change memory, non-volatile memory. Uh, the idea is to minimize the amount of DRAM without sacrificing performance, or the goal is to minimize the amount of DRAM without sacrificing performance and endurance. And uh, the idea is to use the DRAM as a cache to tolerate the latency of page change memory and also the right bandwidth issues of the page change memory that we've discussed, plus uh, alleviate the endurance issues. Uh, basically. Uh, try to uh, access phase change memory as little as possible, uh, as we discussed. Uh, so in this case, phase change memory is main memory. This is the main memory. And it provides large capacity at good cost and power. So this work assumes that uh, for every DRAM cell, you can have four phase change memory cells. So phase change memory is higher density, clearly, in this work. That's the assumption, basically. Uh, remember, in the, in the earlier paper, we were pessimistic. We didn't assume that. We said basically equal, uh, which is uh, a, a good boundary case to examine for sure. Uh, so basically, uh, this is what the system looks like. This is your main memory system. And it has a DRAM buffer inside, as you can see. And the processor interacts with uh, the main memory system this way. It first accesses the DRAM buffer. If the data is in the DRAM buffer, that's good. It gets it. If the data is not in the DRAM buffer, then you need to bring it from phase change memory, phase main memory into the DRAM buffer. And you can see that there's a write queue. So the writes are buffered into the phase change memory. Uh, so this data can stay in this write queue for some time. And the goal is, if everything hits in your DRAM buffer, that's great. Then you, don't, you never access phase change memory. But clearly, that's not going to happen because this DRAM buffer is not going to be as big. Because the goal is to minimize the DRAM buffer to uh, begin with. Uh, but maybe there's a good balance between the size of a DRAM buffer and the size of phase change memory based main memory uh, that gives you very good performance, very good energy, and very good endurance, et cetera. And that's basically uh, what this paper shows. OK. So basically, this paper uh, proposes some write filtering techniques. Uh, one is lazy write. Essentially, uh, the idea is whenever you get a page from disk, uh, you install it only into DRAM. You don't basically put it into PCM. That way, you minimize the writes into the PCM. Clearly, that makes sense. You filter some of the writes. The second idea is partial writes, which is very similar to uh, what we have uh, discussed with our paper earlier. So these two papers had similar ideas. You basically write only dirty cache blocks from the DRAM page into a phase change memory. You don't write the entire DRAM page, basically. And last one is page bypass, which is interesting, basically. Uh, whenever you have a page in DRAM that is to be evicted because you don't have enough space in DRAM, uh, 
you make a decision. Do I write it back to PCM and do, uh, uh, okay. Okay, if the page is dirty, uh, so there are two cases, of course. Uh, the, the page could be dirty or the page could be not dirty. In either case, you have a decision to make, right? Uh, in, if the page is dirty, you have to write it back somewhere, but you have a choice. You can write it back to Flash or you can write it back to PCM. If the page is going not expected to have a lot of reuse, you write it back to Flash because you don't want to uh, uh, wear out your page change memory and clearly writes take a long time, especially if you're writing a huge page, right? Four, four kilobyte page, let's say. Uh, and if, it, if the page is not dirty, meaning if the, the data is not dirty over here, then you, get, you still have a choice. Do I write it back to PCM or do I just drop it? And the idea is if the page is uh, not going to be reused much, maybe you just drop it, right? That's the idea. Uh, so there's a prediction mechanism that this paper proposes. Well, it doesn't discuss the prediction mechanism. It just says software provides hints, basically. But potentially, you can imagine what those hints are, right? OK, so that's the idea, basically. This is one example of a DRM PCM hybrid memory. We're going to see other examples. Uh, and I think this is one good baseline example. Uh, so this work uh, takes another approach to simulation. It's actually somewhat probabilistic simulation. It has an even more abstract simulation than what we had. Uh, in, in the earlier work that I discussed in the same conference. So it simulates a 16 core system, eight gigabyte DR main memory at some number of cycles. So it doesn't distinguish between row buffer hits or misses in this case, uh, which will become important in the next uh, work that I'm going to describe. It simulates a hard disk also, which is interesting. It simulates a flash also, basically. You can see the simulation granularities. Hard disk is two milliseconds, flash is 32 microseconds. And it basically assumes a flash hit rate of 99%. So you can see the uh, tricks you can play with simulation over here. It doesn't basically check if a page exists in flash or not. It basically assumes that 99% of the time, whenever you access the flash memory, you're going to find the data there, which is a good shortcut in simulation, in my opinion, to actually reduce the simulation time. Because otherwise, it's, it takes a lot of time to simulate a system as, as huge as this. So the assumption in this work is the phase change memory is 4x denser than DM. So if 8 gigabyte DRAM, uh, so a 32 gigabyte PCM is equivalent to 8 gigabyte of DRAM. So this clearly gives advantage to phase phase memory, but it's also 4x slower than DRAM. But this is also optimistic, right? If you remember in our paper, we assumed reads are 4x slower, but writes are 12x slower. In this work, uh, it's not clear. Uh, basically, the, not, it's not that it's not clear. There's no disparity between reads and writes, which is actually not correct because uh, there's definitely disparity between reads and writes in phase change memory. Uh, just like in Flash, actually. Uh, and uh, the other assumption is that DRAM block size is equal to phase change memory page size, which is about four kilobytes, as you can see over here. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. The results are surprisingly similar to what we conclude, actually, except we didn't evaluate the phase change memory plus DRAM system. So let's take a look at, and these are different applications, as you can see. There are some database applications, there are some K means clustering, uh, yeah, there's a Q sort, quick sort, as you can see, et cetera. Uh, you can read the paper for more detail. But basically, uh, the execution time is normalized to 8 gigabyte DRAM. What happens with 32 gigabyte PCM? Uh, well, you actually reduce the execution time significantly. So this part, uh, basically, uh, uh, you actually improve performance significantly by replacing DRAM with a larger PCM, 4x larger PCM. That's kind of expected. Why? Because you reduce the number of times you go to flash and hard disk in this case, because now you're your main memory is much bigger, right? And you can see there's a huge effect. You basically improve performance by 2x, which is actually quite good, right? But then you quadruple the memory size that you have. OK. The hope is that 8 gigabyte DRAM is as costly as 32 gigabyte PCM when PCM is mature, which is not the case today. Because PCM is not as mature as DRAM today. DRAM technology has had more than 50 years of manufacturing that has happened. Well, around 50 years, let's say. Actually, more than 50 years is correct. Uh, whereas phase change memory has had only a few years of manufacturing, right? There's a lot of catching up to do in phase change memory. But if you catch up, you're going to get a lot of benefits. Uh, OK, this is actually the comparison that was made in our work, basically. We looked at how does an equal amount of DRAM compare to equal amount of PCM. And you can see that a 32 gigabyte DRAM outperforms 32 gigabyte PCM significantly. Uh, it's about, I don't know, actually, it's, it's maybe close to 40, 60% actually over here. I don't have the exact number, but it's on the ballpark of what we have seen also. It was 60% and we reduced it to 20%, if you remember. Uh, 
that sounds good, right? So this is kind of a validation uh, of the two uh, the 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 ideas uh, that are hap that happen concurrently. Uh, okay, and you can see that uh, this work shows that if you have a hybrid memory system, 32 gigabyte PCM, building on the blue one, and add one gigabyte of DRAM to it, you get performance almost as close to as 32 gigabyte DRAM. Well, you lose some performance, maybe 10%, 15% or something, whatever that is, but you're almost as close. So that's very interesting also because this paper uh, reduces the performance gap between a pure DRAM system and a pure DC PCM system using a hybrid memory with a lot of DRAM, whereas our work uh, tries to reduce the performance gap uh, by re-architecting the internals of the phase change memory chips. And I think both approaches can be combined clearly and you can potentially get, when you combine both approaches, you can get much better, than, potentially better than the, the green bar over here. So this sounds cool, right? It's, uh, it's good to see uh, people thinking similarly, uh, but evaluating differently in some way. And uh, the, uh, there, there are more results in this work, basically. Uh, I think the big upside of using DRAM uh, as a cache to PCM is a hybrid memory system is uh, really the lifetime. I mean, certainly uh, you get performance, you perform similar to similar size DRAM, you get significant energy savings, which is shown here, basically. Uh, but, uh, but the average lifetime is a lot. You can see that it's 9.7 years. So if you have to compare this to our work, it was 5.6 years, right? These are different applications, of course, maybe apples to apples comparisons are not uh, desirable here. But you can see that uh, a 32 gigabyte DRAM is not power efficient. A hybrid memory system is more power efficient and eight gigabyte DRAM is over here. So uh, we're comparing eight gigabyte DRAM, hybrid memory system, 30 gigabyte PCM plus one gigabyte DRAM and 32 gigabyte DRAM. So you can see that hybrid memory system is a good trade-off. It gets the performance of uh, 30 gigabyte DRAM with a fraction of the power cost. It's more energy efficient than both eight gigabyte DRAM and 30 gigabyte DRAM. Why is eight gigabyte DRAM uh, less energy efficient than a 32 gigabyte DRAM? Well, uh, because uh, it takes time longer to execute these programs, right? Uh, so you, you lose a lot of energy. And you also, you also have more data movements because you have to go to the hard disk and flash more. Similarly, energy delay product in terms of energy delay product, a hybrid memory system is much better as you can see. This is also a good argument for having, having uh, larger uh, memories, right? As you can see. Okay, so this also has no guarantees. The unfortunate part is uh, these works initially have no guarantees in terms of lifetime. So there may be an attack program that attacks uh, the system and does a lot of writes, maybe bypasses the DRAM as much as possible, writes into PCM, and uh, the guarantees uh, reduce significantly in that case. And there are later works that looked into guaranteeing some lifetime, and I'm not going to talk about that, but you can find them in literature, uh, and I'm happy to uh, provide pointers if people are interested. Okay, but if you're interested, this work was published in the same conference. This was a second paper. It was, it's from IBM, as you can see, IBM Research. And uh, this is going to be one of the potential readings also that uh, you may do for next homework. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions over here, so I will continue. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, okay, so now let's go into a little bit more detail into this hybrid memory because it becomes interesting now. Because, and the concept is more general than DRAM plus PCM. And here I'm going to generalize the concept. I'm going to ignore some dimensions, of course, but even with two dimensions, latency and capacity, a hybrid memory system becomes very interesting. So let's take a look at two memories, memory A, memory B. Memory A is fast, but small. Memory B is large, but slow. These don't need to be particular technologies, right? You can make any memory fast and small and any memory large and slow, right? So they, they can be exactly the same technology. It's abstract, you can see. So, the data placement problem is which page should be placed in uh, the fast memory, which page should be kept in uh, the large memory. Which memory do we place each page in to maximize system performance, in other words? And I already discussed memory as fast as but small. And also there is another issue over here because if you have two channels to access these memories, which is likely the case, uh, then how do you actually balance the load between the two channels? Because if you uh, if you basically put all of the pages in memory A, let's say, for whatever reason, this becomes idle, right? Remember, you call this problem. We had this problem with memory channel partitioning. You're, in a sense, partitioning the data across the different channels. 
maybe you're not you're dynamically migrating data between the different channels to maximize performance. But if you partition data, you always have a load balance problem. And that's the load balance problem over here. This may lead to an idle or mostly idle or even somewhat idle channel, whereas this may be oversubscribed, right? So we need to be careful in the data placement because of this issue. And also, I think there's another reason to be careful. If you do too frequent page migrations for whatever reason, again, uh, it could be to balance the load also. Uh, they have performance and energy overhead because clearly they occupy bandwidth, clearly they cause latency, clearly they cause energy because they move data across the channels. Okay, so uh, let me give you one idea that advances the state of the art compared to the prior works that uh, improves data placement between DM and PCM based on some observations. And the general idea, the overall idea is to somehow characterize the data access patterns and guide the data placement in hybrid memory. And this is proposed in this work over here. Uh, and this work in particular says that streaming accesses, if you're streaming through memory, consecutive memory locations, these are as fast in PCM as in DM. Why PCM has some row buffer? Okay, the row buffer size may be smaller than DM, but still it has a row buffer. And you can stream data out. And internally, you can actually play a lot of tricks in PCM chips so that you can stream data out uh, much faster, just like we do in DRAM chips, right? Uh, so basically, streaming accesses, the robot, because of the row buffer and internal prefetching mechanisms that happen in uh, chips, uh, can be made as fast in PCM chips as in DRAM. So if you're streaming, you get the same bandwidth and same latency. That sounds great, right? In fact, streaming is very interesting, right? Uh, streaming is basically you basically keep accessing consecutive memory locations. Uh, a, a great example is a video file. A video file, for example, you're streaming over the internet or wherever, uh, comes uh, from consecutive memory locations. And if you design your system really well, you don't need really fast memory for this. Why, for example, video streaming can tolerate a lot of uh, latency. You, need to ju you just need to buffer data appropriately in your system. Right? So on the other hand, on the internet, maybe Maybe you get your video file from a tape, which is really slow clearly, but maybe you can engineer the tape to have a similar streaming bandwidth, uh, streaming read bandwidth as your uh, DRAM potentially, right? That's possible because streaming uh, support is not that hard in systems. You just need to provide the right bandwidth. Latency is a big problem, of course, right? Streaming and streaming is not a latency problem usually because you're streaming hopefully lots of data and uh, you just need to provide the right bandwidth. And even if it's a latency problem, but with enough buffering, you can solve the latency problem, right? And that's what actually a lot of media systems do today, right? On the internet, for example, if you're streaming video, it makes sense to uh, buffer the video for some time if you have latency problems and start the video playback after you have enough, you have enough buffer built up. You don't buffer the entire video on your system, especially if the video is huge, of course, right? Uh, you buffer enough, just enough, to tolerate the long latency that you have while supplying the bandwidth that's expected by the user. Right? OK, and those systems do not need very fast memories. So that's one of the key realizations in memory system design. You don't need really fast memories for uh, streaming accesses. Where you really need fast memories is random accesses. Basically, if you're accessing some location that you did not access recently, uh, and that's not in your row buffer, well, tough luck. You need to activate the location in DRAM, for example. But this activation is much faster in DRAM in the end. Whereas in phase change memory, it's slow, as we discussed. Reads are 4x slower. If the read comes from the row buffer, they could be as fast as DRAM. If the read comes from the array, as we discussed, you don't want to do that read if it's latency critical. You don't want to do it from the array. You'd rather do it from the DRAM. And that's the idea of this paper. Estimate the data access pattern and place random access data with some reuse in DRAM because if the random access data doesn't have reuse, it's not going to be accessed again uh, for, RAM, for some reason, it makes no sense to actually place in DRAM. You're going to touch once and you're never going to touch it again, right? But if the data is streaming, keep it in PCM and don't pollute DRAM with that data because DRAM is precious, right? You don't want to waste valuable fast memory space with data that you can easily handle uh, in a slower but similar bandwidth memory for streaming accesses. So I think this paper actually very, is very interesting because uh, the point is not just about PCM and DRAM, in my opinion. It's really about your access patterns and how your memory can be designed to match those access patterns. And I think from that perspective, 
there's a lot more to do in memory systems. In memory systems, how do we actually design customized memory system to match different access patterns is a very good question. And this is again, a very uh, interesting software hardware co-design problem. First of all, you need to provide the hardware support for different types of access patterns. And I just, uh, I just mentioned that streaming and random are just two different access patterns. There could be actually finer grain access patterns we can discuss. And then you need to actually identify the access patterns in your, in your programs somehow. The hardware can do that potentially, but the software can help also. And then the software can be written to maximize the nice access patterns that you can fit into your hardware, right? That's the idea. And there's a lot actually of potential uh, in this direction. So let me give you the key observation idea of this particular paper now. Uh, row buffers exist in both DEM and PCM, as we've discussed. And row hit latency is similar in DEM and PCM, as we also said earlier, uh, because the uh, peripheral circuitry is made in S, uh, is based on SRAM, right? It's not, it's not with DEM cells or PCM cells. It's really these cross-coupled inverters. Row miss latency is, but, the, but row miss latency is very small in DEM compared to the very large row miss latency in DEM. This is essentially access uh, to the array. And because the array is uh, PCM based, the reads take longer. So the idea of this paper is to place in D in D data in DEM, which has two properties. One, the data is likely to miss in the row buffer that has row buffer locality. Uh, and uh, if you do that, miss penalty is because miss, miss penalty is smaller in DEM, right? That's why you would like to place that data in DEM. But you would like to place data that's reused many times in DM. So you would like to cache only the data that's worth the movement cost and the DM space. That's the idea, basically. Then the question is, of course, who does what? This paper takes a very hardware memory controller-centric approach. And memory controller actually has a structure. Uh, I think it's called a stat store in this paper. It's statistics store, essentially. It basically keeps track of statistics about different rows that are accessed. It basically predicts based on the past access patterns what the future access pattern will be to that row. And if you see that row again, you decide where to place it. That's the idea. And there's hysteresis and heuristics built into the uh, mechanism. As I said, I'm not going to go into the details of the ideas. You need to distinguish between reads and writes, for example, because clearly there's a huge difference between reads and writes in phase change memory. You cannot treat them the same. And I'm not going to go into the details of that also. But basically, if you do, uh, all of them uh, and build a model of deciding when to place data in DM and how to place data in DM, this is what you get. Again, this is going to be a pessimistic comparison. This is 16 gigabyte PCM over here, the 16 gigabyte DM, there's a huge gap between them. And here we actually exercise DM a lot, uh, memory a lot. So that's why the gap is higher. And uh, this hybrid memory is somewhere in between, as you can see. So it's, uh, I think this is 16 gigabyte PCM plus uh, actually, I don't remember exact uh, configuration over here. It could be 16 plus one, uh, but I'm not sure. Or it could be area code. It could be 15 plus one also. I don't remember. You should take a look at the paper. Uh, but uh, whatever it is, it's somewhere in between. Uh, and this is aggressive. Clearly, if you actually say, okay, 64 gigabyte PCM, uh, and I'm going to compare that to 16 gigabyte DM, then this bar becomes much better. So performance becomes much better in that case. So we didn't do that. We just wanted to look at what is the worst, uh, how, how can we optimize this equal capacity case? OK. So this also means that there's more work to do in this area. And I will recommend you take a look at this paper. Again, this paper may be one of the uh, recommended papers uh, for your homework. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. But before that, I'm going to close my window over here. Uh, just give me a second. I'll be back. Okay. Okay, I guess there are no questions, so I'm going to keep going. Feel free to ask questions. Okay, so uh, we're going to go into more state of the art right now. So clearly hybrid memory design is very interesting and there are a lot of works. I cannot possibly cover a lot of works, but there's more. Ne there's need for more works also, maybe more intelligent uh, intelligence built into the hybrid memory also like uh, potentially reinforcement learning based mechanisms or machine learning based mechanisms uh, could be very interesting over here. But basically, uh, all of these solutions that we discussed so far are heuristics that consider only a limited part of memory access behavior. Uh, 
whatever we discussed, robo for locality, for example, write intensity, et cetera, they do not directly capture the overall system performance impact of data placement decisions, frequency of access. And uh, for example, none of them capture memory level parallelism. And I'm going to point out the importance of this. I'm, I pointed out the importance of this multiple times in this class, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And as you know, uh, memory level parallelism is a concurrent memory request from the same application when a page is accessed. This affects how much page migration helps performance. And it's good to think about these things whenever you're designing any mechanism that's related to memory. So for example, let's take a look at uh, what happens uh, before migration. We have request to page one. Uh, it's initially in memory B. And after migration, its access latency becomes shorter. So you save some time. That sounds good, right? So migrating one page reduces stall time by T in this particular case, assuming this is the only page you're stalling for. Right? But what if you had some memory level parallels? So you have a request to page two, a request to page three, and you want both of them at the same time. They're both in memory B. If you migrate only one of them to memory A, well, you don't gain performance because it's very similar to what we have discussed uh, earlier with parallelism or batch scheduling, right? Uh, here in this case, you want to actually migrate both of them to memory A. That's the idea. So if you have the sort of memory level parallelism, you need to basically be careful about it. Not, you must migrate two pages to reduce the stall time that you have. Migrating one page alone does not help in this case. So basically, page migration decisions need to consider MLP. On top of this, they need to consider robot for locality. On top of this, they need to consider write behavior. On top of this, they need to consider uh, how frequently you're going to access a particular page, as we've discussed in the earlier work, et cetera. There may be many other things. So our goal in this work was to have a generalized mechanism that directly estimates the performance benefits of migrating a page between any two types of memory. So we wanted to be very general in this case. And we wanted to directly estimate the performance benefit you would get, how much latency, how much execution time you're going to save in this application if you actually migrate this page at this point in time. And that's a very nice model to have in your memory controller if, you, if, if it's going to decide whether or not to migrate. That, that's what, what we wanted to do over here. And the second part of the mechanism places only the performance critical data in the fast memory. Basically, performance critical data is the data that's going to affect your performance the most. And we call this utility-based hybrid memory management. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I'll just go give you the higher level uh, mechanisms. But this, in the end, builds a model of the effect of each migration on performance, not only just single program performance, but also multi-program performance when you have a multi-program workload. So this is basically a memory manager that works for any hybrid memory, as we will also see in the evaluation. The key idea is for each page, we have a comprehensive uh, set of characteristics that are used to calculate utility. In other words, performance impact of migrating the page from one memory to the other. Okay, So you basically take some characteristics, fit it into an, uh, put it into an equation. That equation estimates the utility, i.e. the performance impact of migrating the page from one memory to the other one. That sounds good, right? It's basically an analytical model, utility model that's employed dynamically during execution. And clearly, you would like to migrate only the pages with the highest utility, uh, pay, uh, in other words, the pages that improve system performance the most when they're migrated. That's the high level idea. Now, if you go into one level, one abstraction level down, how do we do this? Let's go into that a little bit. Basically, for each page, you need to estimate the utility using some performance model. And then migrate only pages whose utility exceed the migration threshold. So this is a threshold-based mechanism from slow memory to fast memory. And you need to periodically adjust the migration threshold to adapt to the program characteristics, which is also important. So how do you actually estimate the utility? Basically, you need to estimate the application stall time reduction based on migration. And this answers the question of how much would migrating a page benefit the performance of the application that the page belongs to? And it's, we also want to estimate the application performance sensitivity how much does the improvement of the single application's performance increase overall system performance? Because there may be many other applications running. And essentially, the utility is estimated by estimating the delta stall time, which is the first one, and the sensitivity. So these are both estimated. As a result, utility is estimated. And the paper discusses how we estimate delta stall time using multiple different uh, uh, parameters and sensitivity also. I'm not going to go into detail, but I think this is a very interesting approach to managing hybrid memories. It's a more complex approach, clearly, because you need to estimate many, many more things now. But nobody said that hybrid memory management is going to be easy. In my opinion, uh, machine learning-based models can actually do even better, and uh, there may be more room 
for them. Here, again, we're humans, right? We're humans designing the model and we're limited in terms of how many things we can consider. Okay, so let me give you some performance results. So uh, this uh, work is a comprehensive in its evaluation, basically it has, uh, basically we have different workloads with different memory intensities. 0% is not memory intensive, 100% is very memory intensive. And this is in between, it's multi-program workloads. All means uh, you have a PCM plus DRAM system, I believe. And if all means, whenever you touch something in PCM, you migrate into DRAM. Frequent means you just migrate frequently touched pages from PCM to DRAM. RBLA is robo for locality aware management, like we discussed in the earlier work. And UHMEM is utility-based hybrid memory. And you can see that RBLA is the state of the art, which is the best. And you can see that you, uh, high, uh, taking into account this utility metric clearly improves the decisions that you make significantly, especially when you're pressured uh, at high memory bandwidth. So this is very interesting because uh, this, this actually gives you much better performance at very high memory utilization, which is usually not uh, easy to improve. Uh, so you don't get a lot of benefit over here, as you can see, as expected. Okay, uh, so this is one of the state-of-the-art hybrid memory managers today, as you can see. And this is also a very good, uh, and you can see that in simulation, you can simulate all of these. So complementing the lecture we had Previously, you can see how we can simulate a lot of these things. And then you can also simulate this, which is basically, you, we just change the latencies. So basically uh, this is activation latency. This is the right latency, right recovery latency. And we can change uh, how high it is compared to, in, the, in the slow memory compared to the fast memory. So here, for example, we can simulate slow memory being three X slower than the fast memory in both reads and writes. Here we simulate slow memory being 7.5x slower uh, than the fast memory in terms of reads and 20x slower in terms of writes. And you can actually imagine other values over here clearly, uh, right? So you can do this sort of experiment nicely if you have a good simulator where you can do it, right? Basically, this is not so hard to do. You just dial in a different TRCD and different uh, TWR, right? Recovery in that case. Okay. So you can see uh, the improvements over here. So it turns out uh, when the disparity between the memories are actually higher, a lot higher, and the write and read latencies are uh, there, you get significant speed up uh, over here. So the conclusion is that for a wide variety of different hybrid memory systems with different latencies, this utility-based mechanism um, improves performance. And if you're interested more, this paper has uh, more detail on how this exactly works. And the source code is also uh, online and you can actually download it and take a look at it. Okay, so basically what we've been talking about is uh, really a challenge and opportunity. How do we enable an emerging technology to augment DRAM? And that's uh, where hybrid memory actually comes in. Uh, how do you manage hybrid memories? But again, as I said, this is a much more general concept. Like you can imagine different types of DRAM with different latencies, right? And that's could be your management criteria, right? Clearly you may have very fast DRAM uh, that's small, that's high cost, and then very slow, uh, some, somewhat slow DRAM that's larger, uh, reasonable cost, and then huge amounts of very slow DRAM that's uh, even larger, well, I said huge amounts of, uh, but that's very low cost also, right? So that's another uh, way of looking into it, right? Not, not just DRAM plus PCM clearly. So hybrid memory is a more general concept as you can see. So let me talk about another challenge before I switch gears a little bit. And I'm gonna talk quickly about designing effective large caches. And large caches are important in this case because if your cache is one gigabyte, four gigabytes, uh, and if your block size is 64 bytes, then you have a problem, right? How do you design the tax store? Basically a large DRAM cache requires a large metadata, in other words, tax store, because you need to keep block-based information. The key question is how do you design an efficient DRAM cache? And why is this tax store important? Basically, if you have DRAM as a cache for phase change memory, you want this fast cache. It's small, but it's still large from the perspective of existing caches. It could be one gigabyte, let's say. You want to quickly consult the tax store, basically. So a CPU wants to load X. You want to quickly consult the tax store metadata that says X is in DRAM, so access DRAM, right? Okay, and then you get the data. Or uh, that X says uh, uh, X is actually in PCM, right? 
So where do you store this metadata? How do you store this metadata becomes a problem because that large, that metadata is large. So assume that this is a, okay, let me pick four gigabytes. Four gigabytes is two to 32 bytes. Uh, if you have 64 byte blocks, that's two to six. You have two to the 26 uh, tag store entries. If each tag store entry is eight bytes, you need to store two to the 26. Uh, well, if each tag store entry is eight bytes, eight bytes sounds large. If each tag store entry is one byte, okay, let's pick one byte, which is really small. Uh, probably you were not going to get away with one byte, but let's pick one byte. Uh, then you need to have two to the 26 bytes. And that's a lot. Clearly that's uh, 64 megabytes, right? For your tax store. Okay, each tax store entry is four bytes, which is more reasonable than one byte. Now that's, you, have, you, have, you need to have 256 megabytes of tax store. Now that's also a lot. So you don't want to have that. Where do you have it basically? If you put it in the memory controller, does it really make sense to have a 256 megabyte tax store for a, a DRAM cache over here, right? So you get the problem basically. Uh, so how do you design an efficient DRAM cache in this case? Where do you place the tag store? So basically, there are multiple ideas. I'm going to quickly discuss them. One idea is put the tags in memory. Uh, basically, you have the tag store inside the DRAM itself, and you first access DRAM to get the tag and check whether the, they, uh, the address you're accessing is it actually in DRAM or not. And then after you get the tag and do the tag match, you decide whether to access DRAM and PCM for the real access. Okay. This is a bad idea if your tag store is in a separate row uh, than the DM that holds the data for the hack store tag. So uh, because now you need to access DM in one location and then you need to access DM in another location. So you get two row buffer uh, misses and two accesses. Whereas if the DM uh, row is organized that looks like this, basically you have cache blocks and then tags associated with them. Basically if you store the tags in the same row as the data in DM, then the data and the metadata can be accessed together and you, you can somehow play tricks combining the tag access and the data access or at least minimizing the latency for the data access after you do the tag check. That's the idea. You first access the tag in the row. If it's a hit, you can get the cache block relatively quickly. If it's a miss, well, you have to access the PCM at that point in time. Of course, the big, big benefit of this is there's no on-chip tag storage overhead. You lose some DM uh, storage, of course, in this case. The downside is cache it is determined only after DRAM access. Okay, yes, that's a big downside. And cache it requires two DRAM accesses, which is a downside. But at least one is zero, the second is zero buffer hit, hopefully. Okay, so this is not good enough, but it's better than having the tags in a different group than the data. Okay, the second idea actually tries to eliminate the metadata storage overhead. Uh, and the idea is to cache an OMCHIP SRAM frequently access metadata, okay? Uh, well, uh, not the, the, the idea doesn't try to eliminate the metadata storage overhead, but the idea uh, tries to eliminate the two accesses to DRAM basically, that's the idea. So we want to cache the tag store, part of the tag store in on-chip SRAM in the memory controller just for frequently access metadata, hopefully. And hopefully you can get away with caching only a small amount to keep the SRAM size small. And the paper that I'm going to mention uh, does it that way. So basically now, uh, if you go back to this picture over here, you have the tag store in DM, but you cache parts of it in the memory controller. That way, if you hit into this cache uh, of the tag store, you can basically quickly say, quickly uh, understand whether you should access DM or PCM to get the data. That's the idea over here. And this is very effective, it turns out. Okay, the last idea in this work is to have dynamic data transfer granularity. And this is important because transferring large amounts of data from PCM to DRAM and back is not good for bandwidth. So, uh, but sometimes it's good. Some applications benefit from caching more data because they have good spatial locality, but others do not. Because large granularity wastes a lot of bandwidth and reduces cache utilization in DRAM cache. So this idea over here is to have a simple dynamic caching granularity policy. Uh, it has a cost benefit model. It, uh, the memory controller does cost benefit analysis to determine the best DRAM cache block size. And the idea is uh, a little bit sophisticated, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but basically you group memory sets into rows and you sample the row, uh, different, uh, different sets of rows follow different policies, different uh, caching granularity. Some of them, for example, 64 bytes, some of them follow 128 bytes, some of them follow uh, four kilobytes, let's say. And then you look at uh, uh, the hit rates that you get in each of them. 
not just hit rates, but the latency of movement, et cetera. Basically, there's a model over here. And you decide, OK, at this point in time, a 64-byte granularity is performing really well. So I'm going to switch the rest of main memory to follow that granularity. That's the idea. So uh, cost-benefit analysis basically looks at access latency versus number of cachings. And this is evaluated every, uh, once every quantum. So it's a time-based mechanism, again, interval-based. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but basically the key idea is to switch the high level key idea is to switch between different granularities of caching, 64 byte, 4 kilobyte, 256 byte, et cetera, based on which one is performing well uh, dynamically over time, based on some sampling that you do. And then the, the rest, the devil is in the details, of course. How, you, how do you do that sampling exactly? So, okay, if you do all of this, this is what you get. This mechanism is called timber, and timber uh, tags in memory, uh, and then uh, Dynamic is really dynamic granularity. Basically, you get very close to uh, a full SRAM-based tag store. So this is the SRAM-based tag store, which can be 256 megabytes, for example. Here, we don't have the 256 megabytes. I think it's replaced with eight kilobytes of SRAM in the memory controller, plus the tag store is in main memory, DRAM. So you still have the wastage of space, but there is no other way around that, perhaps. Uh, and the performance is very similar to a perfect tag store that's in uh, SRAM. And you can see these are different versions, which I'm not going to go into. And the energy efficiency is actually much better, as you can see, uh, because this uh, has much fewer migrations, because it's being intelligent about uh, the granularity of the data moments. OK, so I wanted to cover this, because it's one of the earliest works uh, that look at uh, how to design policies uh, for DRAM caches and how to design the DRAM caches themselves to minimize uh, data movement uh, and to minimize complexity. There's more in this work that I'm not going, I have not actually talked about, but you can read the paper in more, uh, in more detail. It's only a four page paper actually. Okay, later actually many works appeared related to DM caches. And again, I'm not going to go into many of them, including this one. I'm going to very briefly talk about this one. This is one of the most recent works actually. Well, not most recent, one of the more recent works. But you can see that the, even this work compares to four other works at least over here. And you can see that uh, the DRAM cache management mechanisms have different design choices. This could be hardware software cooperative actually. Later people figure out that maybe pure hardware DRAM caches are not as easy to design because you have this huge tax store overhead, right? Uh, maybe we want some support from the software also. Uh, and uh, as we will see, uh, you can, for example, uh, keep track of uh, entries uh, in the DRAM cache using the TLBs and page tables in virtual memory. This fixes your granularity potentially to uh, the page size. Uh, maybe you can also change that with adding more complexity, but you can, act you can potentially do this actually. Uh, actually, you can reduce the granularity uh, also. Uh, okay, but basically uh, there are different DRAM caching schemes uh, that I'm not going to go into. They differ in terms of what happens in terms of who, who manages things, hardware or software, as you can see. Uh, can they help with large page caching? What kind of, uh, what kind of actions are uh, taken on DM cache hit? What kind of actions are taken on DM cache miss? How do you do the replacement traffic, et cetera, et cetera. You can read, uh, I would I recommend reading this paper because it has a good survey and good comparison to all of these other works. Uh, let me give you the ideas in this work uh, because I think uh, the idea is actually quite interesting. This is a hardware software cooperative mechanism, as I said. And the idea is to track the presence in DRAM cache using a TLB and a page table. Basically, uh, punt the problem to the operating system to minimize complexity. This way, you don't need a tag store for DRAM cache. Right? You're, you just need to augment the page table with a single bit. Does this, is this page currently cached in DRAM or not? That sounds good, right? It's just a single bit per every page table entry. And of course, you may want to add more bits for replacement, et cetera, uh, but you can read the paper for more detail. But to track presence, you just need a single bit, which is much better than the 256 megabyte structure that we talked about earlier, right? Uh, that uh, you need to have if you have a purely hardware managed cache. But of course, uh, and uh, there, this, there, there are some downsides to this also, right? For example, uh, what happens if the cache uh, evicts uh, the, uh, uh, this page, uh, then you need to actually keep the TLBs and the page tables consistent. Uh, and that's important 
because different memory controllers can emit different things. Uh, and different entries can be cached in different TLBs. So you need to be very careful in terms of this TL. So there's a new TLB coherence protocol that's employed in this work that's lazy, meaning that it doesn't basically flush, uh, uh, inform the software on every eviction. It informs the software in batches basically, which I think a good idea also. Uh, as a result, it keeps the overhead in check. But it adds some complexity into the system, of course, right? You're getting rid of the complexity of the tax store uh, by getting rid of the tax store mostly, uh, but you're adding complexity into the TLB coherence mechanisms. Okay, this work uh, does another contribution, which is a frequency-based replacement policy that's bandwidth aware. Depending on how much bandwidth you have, uh, it basically scales the, uh, uh, the uh, caching uh, frequency, essentially. And in the end, it provides good performance compared to all of the other previous mechanisms that it compares to, as you can see. It's significantly better than prior art. Again, I'm not going to go into more detail on this, uh, but I think this is a very good representative example of a hardware software cooperative uh, mechanism uh, that can enable some good things in terms of a hybrid memory that uses DRAM as a cache. Okay, so let me talk about some other opportunities with emerging memory technologies in the rest of the time, because so far we've talked about emerging memory technologies uh, as replacing DRAM, as being part of hybrid memory, et cetera. These are all good. No question about that, but these emerging memory technologies can enable even more. So one of them we're going to talk a lot about is merging of memory and storage. It can enable new applications potentially because you have persistent memory right now. Uh, and what do you do with this persistent memory? How, you get rid of your DRAM, for example, your uh, persistent memory becomes uh, the main, the norm. Maybe you can actually uh, improve your boot up speed because uh, you don't need to load the applications. Uh, from SSD anymore. Of course, that's simple. Uh, maybe you can have ultra fast checkpoint and restore. People have explored that uh, so that you can actually run uh, in, a, in, a very, in very faulty environments relatively well. Uh, or when your energy source is constrained, uh, meaning that you don't have a lot of energy, a lot of battery, for example, you can do computation uh, uh, and you can save the results in persistent memory often so that uh, whenever you lose the energy, you don't lose uh, the data that you produced, right? So there could be new applications uh, that could benefit a lot from these emerging, especially persistent memory technologies. Uh, well, uh, persistence is really a characteristic of the data, in my opinion. Uh, I should say non-volatile memory technologies that enable persistent applications, right? Persistent, uh, that enable fast persistence of data. Uh, okay, so that's actually very interesting. I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but you can imagine uh, different networks and there are a lot of different applications. So robust system design, actually, I kind of talked about that. Redu you can reduce data loss by being persistent. Today, one problem with systems is, uh, for example, systems buffer persistent updates in DRAM, but if you get a power loss, you may never write back the persistent updates from DRAM uh, to, uh, to uh, your disk, right? As a result, you may actually lose data in existing systems whenever you lose power. Uh, and this may become worse if you're very much energy constrained. So you may actually have more robust systems uh, if uh, you have a persistent memory-based system. And finally, you can have processing much tightly coupled with memory, as we will discuss. Uh, you can enable efficient search and filtering. You can enable efficient uh, large-scale data intensive applications. It can enable efficient uh, ma um, matrix multiplication operations. Uh, efficient neural networks, as many people have been looking at uh, more recently. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, before I move to merging of memory and storage. Okay, let's see if there are any questions. So maybe you can imagine other things also clearly. This is a fascinating topic, I think. It's always good to imagine other things with new technologies. Okay, so let me start with the last one uh, over here, because this is something that we have examined before, clearly, computation and memory. And recall that we talked about in-memory block bitwise operations. And recall that uh, we said uh, in, in DRAM, we can support all of these operations that are bulk bitwise, majority function, not, or, and, zeroing, copying, et cetera, with row clone and ambit by using analog computation capability and activating multiple rows actually performs computation. And we get significant benefit. You remember the ambit paper and in DRAM bulk bitwise execution engine. And while we were doing that, we also said that emerging memory technologies enable even more opportunities because you can operate on data with minimal movement. I'm going to show you examples of this in a little bit. But we also discussed this work that actually uh, applies row clone and uh, 
block bitwise operations in Ambit to phase change memory, right? If you remember this, uh, it's called Pinatubo. And I've shown you the picture uh, where they actually say, uh, uh, it's interesting, I didn't realize that they were saying moving tons of data, which is interesting terminology, moving a lot of data, let's say, to CPU and write back. Uh, but basically, uh, these folks are showing uh, that you can, uh, you can do n row bitwise operations inside NVM. They're not specific to PCM, actually. They're, they're more general. But basically, the idea of Ambit and row clone are applicable uh, to any type of memory, as you can see, including page change memory, as these folks have shown. And they basically generalize the concept to n row bitwise operations. Um, it's clearly two, uh, three row comp uh, com uh, computes a majority function, but they also examine n row uh, in this case. And you can read the paper for more detail. And they show significant benefit on multiple applications like graph processing, machine learning. So this is clearly one style of using emerging memory technologies, very similar to Ambit, basically. Ambit and row clone. And you can actually improve performance just similarly to Ambit and row clone. So that's one opportunity, clearly. And we've already seen this. That's why I'm not going to go into more detail of this. But there is another opportunity that these new memory uh, technologies provide. And that's uh, very interesting for especially matrix multiplication. Uh, type of operations. Uh, and uh, people are actually doing this uh, right now. Some of them, uh, some field folks are actually manufacturing uh, memory arrays that can do this. If you look at the circuits conferences, some of these manufacturing devices go as early as 2013 or so. Uh, but basically, uh, the, uh, the memory uh, array can be used as uh, a matrix multiplication engine. Let's, let's put it that way. Uh, Essentially, emerging memory technologies have cross-fire array structure, as I will show you in a little bit. Uh, actually, many of them can be made to have this cross-fire array structure with different trade-offs. Reliability is uh, one of the trade-offs, of course. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this. I'm going to treat this as a more general concept. Uh, and cross-fire arrays can be, perform can be used to perform dot product operations using the analog computation capability present in such memories. So this is going to be very interesting, I think. Uh, basically. You can operate on multiple pieces of data using Kirchhoff's laws. And hopefully you all know Kirchhoff's laws. Uh, it's basic electronics. Uh, maybe people have, have actually seen it in high school. How many people have seen this in high school? I would expect some people, if not all. I don't see any hands. How many people did not see it in high school? Oh, okay, some people raised hands. So some people actually have seen it in high school, as I would expect, actually. So there's more high school hands. That's good. But I see only two hands, so not everybody has seen it in high school. How many people have seen it at the university? OK, I see more hands. So these don't, these don't need to be exclusive, clearly. OK, so university for sure. <laughs> That's good, which means that you've taken a basic electrical engineering class. Uh, but I'm going to show you what this is very clear, uh, quickly, of course. Uh, but basically, using this, uh, you can essentially bit line current that you have uh, is a sum of products of word line uh, voltage times uh, the cell conductance or one over cell, cap uh, cell resistance. That's the idea over here. Uh, clearly, uh, sum of products is because of Kirchhoff's laws, because uh, current is addit additive. And each cell has some uh, voltage applied to it and some resistance. So each cell does this multiplication, basically. If you apply some voltage to the cell, uh, you get the output current as voltage times one over the cell resistance. And if you have many cells in the bit line, you just add all of them, add all of these values for each cell. And I'm going to show you pictorially this one. And this essentially gives you a dot product, basically. You have one vector, which is the input voltage vector. And you have another vector, which is the cell resistance vector on the bit line. You're taking the dot product of two vectors. And that's a very powerful operation. And this is completely analog. It's based completely on Kirchhoff's laws, as you will see, because current is additive. And clearly, uh, current is equal to voltage divided by resistance, right? as you already, already know. OK, so the computation is an analog domain inside the crossbar array, basically, as we will see. But of course, at some point, you need peripheral circuitry for digital to analog and analog to digital conversion of inputs and outputs, just like DRAM needs to have. Uh, so in DRAM, uh, uh, you have chart sharing, right? DRAM operates using chart sharing. But here, we're use, operating using Kirchhoff's laws. Uh, uh, because we don't have charge in this case, but we have resistance. 
inside the cells. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. So this is a picture copied from this paper, which I have uh, recommended also in a later uh, slide. But basically, uh, this was published four years ago in ISCA. It's not the first paper in this area. Actually, there are earlier papers that are interesting, but this has a nice depiction. Uh, basically, uh, let's assume that you have, this is the crossbar structure that I was talking about. This is a four by four crossbar. And each memory cell can be shown as resistance over here connected to the crossbar. Ignore the digital analog converter, analog digital converter. We're going to see that later on. But basically, this is uh, two. Let's take a look at the two cells over here on the bit line. Uh, if you apply voltage one to the first cell and voltage two to the second cell concurrently, and G is conductance of the cell, G1 and G2, which is basically one over R1 and one over R2, the current that you get at the end is the sum of the currents that are at this point and at this point. So what are the sum of those currents? Basically, uh, the current I1 over here is V1, G1. And the current I2 that, will, that you will get over here is V2 times G2. And you sum them up. Remember, G1 is 1 over R1. G2 is 1 over R2. This is really conductance, which is the inverse of uh, resistance. This is how you can do multiply and accumulate. Basically, this is a dot product, right? You get V1, G1 plus V2, G2. It's a dot product of two, two uh, entry vectors. So that sounds good. Now what you can do here is a matrix vector product or vector, vector matrix product. So you, you input one set of voltages and those voltages travel across uh, this matrix. And in each location, uh, well, in each bit line, you multiply uh, the vector that you input, the voltage vector that you input, with the resistance vector that you have in the bit line. And you get one value over here. And then you get another value over here, another value over here, another value over here. And the result is a vector. So basically, you can do matrix vector multiplication. And assuming that this is your matrix of, let's say, weights in a neural network, you're essentially evaluating uh, the input uh, features that you're feeding into your neural network, right? Of course. You need to do more to orchestrate a bigger neural network if the neural network is bigger than four by four in this case. But that the rest is really data orchestration as we will also very briefly see. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but this is your vector matrix. This is vector vector multiplication. If you have many bit lines, you get a vector matrix multiplication. Of course, you need to, uh, if you don't start with voltages, you need to convert digital to analog. Yeah, you start with ones and zeros. You need to convert one to, uh, from digital to analog. This is not a huge problem. The analog to digital may be a problem over here, actually. Uh, you need to do sensing circuitry, but it's possible to implement these, I think, uh, with some overhead, of course, clearly. And then you can add more uh, reduction operations. For example, you can shift and add. You can, you can add different operations over here. And this SNH over here is a sample and hold operation, basically, to make sure that you, get the you capture the data over here before you do the analog to digital conversion. OK, so that's the idea, basically. So let's, let, let's look at it pictorially very quickly. So you store the weights of your vector in uh, your bit line. In this case, weights are uh, designated by R values over here. And again, a high R value may indicate a weight of one. A low R value may indicate a weight of zero. But again, it doesn't need to be digital, right? It can be, uh, it can be arbitrary weights. So you can actually use the full scale of the R value, meaning you can actually represent a number. If your R value is between zero and 1,000, you can represent the full scale, right? And this is analog, so you can actually represent a huge full scale in this case. So that's the power of this. You can, you're doing uh, not digital multiplication, you're doing analog multiplication, meaning you're, you're using Kirchhoff's laws to do the multiplication. So it's much more powerful than any digital multiplier that we can build uh, today. So basically, this is what you get. Uh, V1, uh, so I1 that you get at the end is uh, a dot product of the a voltage vector and the resistance vector over here. That's what it is, well, one over resistance vector. I should put it that way. So you need to program your weights intelligently. You need to, imp uh, 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 so that they reflect uh, the weights in the digital domain, of course, because you know, eventually you're gonna convert everything to the digital domain. But this is uh, how you do the cal calculation. And it's not just I1, uh, the current actually, okay, let me actually go through this. Uh, so at a high level, let's assume that this is your input vector. This is your weight matrix in your network, for example. 
and you get the output vector. So how do you do it? You basically program first your cells uh, to the weight matrix. And you, of course, you need to use the analog values over here. And then you input your input vector after converting it from the digital to analog. And then your input vector flows into the matrix and you get the output vector, basically. That's the idea. And the hope is that this happens very quickly, right? Because it's, it's just analog. There's no, uh, in a, there's no clocking that happens. So hopefully in one cycle, assuming that you keep the cycle, uh, memory cycle long enough, you, you essentially uh, get uh, the values of the output vector. And then you can do other operations on the output vector. For example, you can add these values if that's what you want to do, uh, uh, depending on what you want to do afterwards. Okay, so clearly this requires peripheral circuitry, which we've already discussed actually, digital to analog converter, some sampling and holding to make sure that you don't lose the value over here. And, uh, and you get the correct value sampled over here and analog to digital conversion. And then you can operate on digital data over here. If you have some more analog blocks, clearly you can potentially operate on them also, but reliability could potentially be an issue if you keep adding a lot of analog blocks. But this domain is completely analog over here and the rest is uh, clearly digital. Okay, so hopefully this is interesting. So how do you do convolution in something like this? Uh, so this is a nice animation, uh, as you can see. Uh, so this, uh, the, the blue part can, uh, your, can be your input. So this, this basically shows you a two-dimensional convolution. In, in image processing, you normally have three-dimensional uh, convolution because you have the depth information also, for example, but I'm ignoring that over here. Uh, basically, uh, the, the blue part is your input, if it's five by five. Uh, kernel uh, is the gray part, which is your filter. You can think of this as the weights now. Uh, and the output is going to be five by five. This is going to be the green one. Uh, basically, your filter goes over uh, the, each of the input elements, like what's, it, what's happening in this picture, with a stride of one, meaning it, 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 it visits every single element consecutively. And it basically generates an output that's designated, as you can see over here. Okay? And there's some padding to make sure that on the boundary conditions, you still compute something. Uh, well, compute something correctly, basically. That padding could be important, actually, depending on what you fill the pad with, pads with. But basically, this is the idea. And the idea is uh, you map your kernel into, uh, the, uh, into the MVM array. You, set, you program your resistances according to this filter values that you have. And then you slide your inputs through the matrix vector multiplication on the using the kernel and the output values are determined based on your analog computation. That's the idea. And you can size the dimensions. I'm not going to talk about that. But of course, this is more complicated when you go into three-dimensional uh, uh, inputs and three-dimensional outputs uh, and many kernels. Uh, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but basically, it's essentially what I showed you earlier. If your kernel looks like this, if it's three-dimensional, 64, 3, 3, you can actually have it one-dimensional like this, uh, and you can have different kernels, as you can see. And then uh, you can take uh, similar parts uh, of your input and input it into the array. So your kernels are fixed. Your kernels are programmed into uh, the processing in memory array, the crossbar over here using the resistances. So you can see that uh, we have 64, 3, 3 over here, and 64 of them, and then uh, more of them, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then basically you stream your inputs such that it goes through all of the kernels and then eventually you get the output uh, vector. Well, in this case, it's a two-dimensional two matrix over here. Basically, you convert everything into a vector. Uh, your uh, matrices uh, are converted to, into vectors also. And then eventually you get the result as a vector, but then you can interpret it as a, a matrix as well. Okay, so that's the basic idea. You can map all of your computations by keeping your kernels inside uh, the PIM array or non-volatile memory computation memory array and then streaming your input into the array, okay? And then you get your outputs. So this sounds pretty powerful, of course. Of course, the difficulty is uh, how big your array can be. If this is too small, then it, it, it's not worth the effort probably. If it's really big, then it becomes very interesting, of course, because now you can do 1 million by 1 million multiplication potentially, right? That sounds good to me because that, is, that takes a lot of time clearly if you, uh, and also energy 
in existing digital systems. Now you're doing everything in analog. But of course, the reliability can potentially be a problem. Uh, ideally, you don't want to change your weights much. So you want to reuse the kernels that you map over here as much as possible with many, many inputs. So this is actually very nice for inference engines, for example. If you've trained your network, for example, and your network is not going to change much, you basically bake in uh, your weights into uh, the hardware. Uh, and then uh, let's say you design your favorite cat detector, right? Cat detector, uh, uh, I don't know, neural network. Sounds boring and terrible, but fine. Some of the networks are good at cat detection. Uh, and then you basically map it onto your specialized hardware. And then uh, you stream your input images. Whatever image you see, you take your phone and go around, and your phone takes all of the images, and you basically try to figure out what's a cat and what's not a cat, basically. And that's possible. You don't move, you don't move any of the weights anywhere, and you do the analog computation on the input vector and the weights relatively easily. So that sounds good. Clearly, there are better applications than cat detection. Uh, I mean, COVID detection could be one, potentially, right? If you can train a good neural network for that purpose. But uh, we're not going to talk about that. OK. So this is uh, one overview of a uh, non-volatile memory-based PIM system. Uh, if you would like to offload, for example, neural network computation inside your memory completely and be very efficient about it, uh, it's not enough just to have this crossbar structure, basically, because a neural network is more than uh, just a matrix multiplication in the end. Uh, so that's why you need multiple things. So this is uh, an example over here. Uh, so uh, this is non-volatile memory-based PIM. You can have memory subarrays, which store data. You can have buffering subarrays, and then the processing subarrays. So processing subarrays is actually where the computation is done. This is one incarnation of non-volatile memory-based processing in memory. So processing subarrays are uh, what are responsible for processing clearly. And uh, even if you look internally over there, then you still need to add more, basically. So you can see that this is the crossbar array we've been talking about so far. This is really the core processing unit for vector matrix multiplication. But for a neural network, you need more. Uh, for example, you need, some, you need to compute some nonlinear functions in, in many neural networks uh, because these nonlinear functions need to be computed to actually operate on the data. So there's something called really operations in neural networks, and that requires some extra hardware. And also, if you need to do some other operations like reduction, et cetera, you may need to do, have uh, some other arrays over here. It's called a multiplier array over here. But this entire system can do your entire neural network computation without disturbing any other part of the system, basically, as long as you have the weights set nicely over here. So this could be an integral part of your uh, system on a chip, let's say, to do uh, inference or maybe even training in your neural network uh, for your neural networks. Okay, so hopefully that's interesting. And if you're interested more, these are some of the papers that cover the space. Uh, they're actually earlier papers, but I didn't put them. I just tried to put that put some of the papers that are a little bit easier to understand. There are some circuit level papers that are somewhat harder to understand, but I would recommend uh, looking into uh, these works uh, if you're interested. And there's more research that's going on in this area currently. In fact, uh, research in this area has exploded, exploded more recently, clearly because of the importance of uh, neural networks today, uh, and also the potential of uh, analog computation in terms of not just performance improvements, but also energy savings. Because every time uh, you do digital computation, you lose a lot of energy. Whereas if you do this in the analog domain, uh, if you do the matrix vector multiplication in the analog, analog domain, and if you, if you can have very large arrays doing this, you can be much more energy efficient. Of course, the downside is, uh, the conversion operations that you have. You want to minimize those conversion operations. That's why large arrays also help. Uh, and you want to uh, make those conversion operations between analog to digital and digital to analog as efficient as possible. OK, so I don't think I have time to cover uh, some of these other opportunities. Uh, I guess I will decide whether or not uh, we will discuss this in the next lecture. But this is a fascinating part also. So we will probably discuss this because this is another example of hardware software cooperation. And I believe this is also another example of hardware software cooperation, actually, non-volatile memory-based analog computation. Uh, as you can see, we're really spanning across the stack uh, and they're doing cross-layer design to improve the efficiency and performance of the systems.
So I think this is a good place to stop, uh, but I'm happy to take questions for a few minutes if people are interested in asking questions at this moment. Okay, maybe I'll wait for 30 seconds. Otherwise, I'm sure people are also uh, ready to jump into the weekend, for, perhaps. I, all, I, I wish you all a COVID-19 free weekend. Be careful out there, because apparently you're the only one who is responsible for being careful, uh, because the rules are not very tight, unfortunately. But I would suggest making your rules tight, because uh, there are lives at stake here. Okay, uh, this is where I'm going to stop. Feel free to have more discussion on Piazza uh, and have a good weekend. Uh, take care.